Listen and Live Audio presents How to Instantly Connect with Anyone. 46 All New Little Tricks for Big Success in Relationships. Written and read by Leo Lowndes. Introduction You and a professor of psychiatry walk into a laboratory and see two naked men sitting in straight back chairs wearing nothing but embarrassed smiles on their faces. The professor mercifully throws each a blanket while explaining your assignment for the day. These two gentlemen, he informs you, both work in a multinational corporation. One is the CEO. He has a loving family, faithful employees, and adoring friends. He has enough money to enjoy life, care for everyone he loves, and even donate generously to charity. The other, he continues, cleans floors at the company. He, too, is a good and honest man. However, this fellow has a string of failed relationships, few friends, and he has trouble making ends meet. You, my dear student, are to determine which is which. You look at the two men quizzically. There doesn't seem to be much difference between them. They look to be about the same age, of comparable weight, similar complexions, and, if it can be determined by looks, equal intelligence. Neither would make the cut for a Cosmo centerfold, but you would classify both as handsome. Hmm, you respond. I'm sorry, I can't tell who has which job. The professor continues. What if I further told you that both men were born into families of the same socioeconomic status, grew up in the same neighborhood, played together as children, went to the same schools, and tested pretty closely on an IQ test? Now you are completely flummoxed. Have you ever been confused like that? You see two people who from all outward appearances are similar, yet one is successful, the other a failure. One has many friends and supporters, the other doesn't. One lives above that glass ceiling where only winners dwell. But the other looks up longingly, asking himself, Why are they up there and I'm still struggling down here? The professor smiles, turns to his subjects, and says, Thank you, gentlemen. You may go now. They are as thankful as you are that the experiment is over. Grasping their blankets tightly around themselves, they stand up. Subject number one turns to subject number two and says, I bet you're glad that's over, Joe. Good job. Then, walking out the door, he looks at you and says, Gentlemen, I know that must have been an uncomfortable experiment for both of you. I hope the next one is more pleasant. You must be doing very important research. But as subject number two starts to leave, he mumbles, Glad I could help you out. He then pauses for a moment at the door, looking expectant. The professor hands him some money. Subject number two quickly takes it and starts to put it in his pocket, until he realizes he doesn't have one. The professor closes the door and once again asks you the big question. So, my dear student, now do you know which is the CEO and which is the cleaner? Yes, now you do know. With a big smile, you confidently reply. The first is the CEO. Right, and how did you know, the professor asks. Well, you respond, the first fellow was concerned with the other man's feelings. The second guy, come to think of it, said, I am glad that I could help you out, putting the emphasis on himself. That made it sound like we owed him something. Exactly, the professor exclaims. You see, the first gentleman put himself in the other person's mindset, thus creating an instant connection with him. He predicted Joe's discomfort and complimented him to alleviate it. The second fellow referred only to himself. He had that you-owe-me attitude, encouraging me to pay him off. I did, and thus we have no further debt to him whereas subject number one identified with us. If he should contact us for something in the future, we would remember and welcome his call. Um, uh, but Professor, you hesitantly ask, why were they naked? He chuckles. The reason I stripped them of their clothes for this experiment was to shrink their comfort level and thus see how each would react in a strange or new situation, as we must all do daily. The Professor looks at you. Did you sense how much more confident the CEO was? That was because he wasn't thinking about himself. 
His mind was busy predicting how the other fellow felt being put in that painful position. Therefore, his own discomfort took a back seat. Do you remember his first words? He said, Bet you're glad that's over, Joe. Good job. He sensed that at that moment Joe needed a self-esteem booster. He also thought about our emotions. He understood that conducting an experiment with two naked men was probably not a comfortable situation for us either. Do you remember what he said to us? You do. He forecast our sentiments and expressed trust in the significance of our research. He then wished us well. He expressed his awareness and predicted how we might feel about conducting the strange experiment. In contrast, the floor scrubber spoke only of himself. He expressed no perception of how we might feel. You can see how subject number two's selfishness and lack of sensitivity could be a tiny pinprick. Let's call it a pain prick. That was the professor's only contact with Joe, and he had no others to offset it. Although subtle, it was sharp enough to deflate any desire that he might have to do things for Joe or to see him again. Throughout his life, this poor chap had probably let too many pain pricks pile up with people. No one promoted him from floor scrubber. What is this quality that enables people to connect instantly with others like the CEO did? I call it emotional prediction, or EP. He was able to predict how the professor, Joe, and you would feel right after the experiment, and he spoke accordingly, as though he were inside your head. At this point, you may be asking how emotional prediction differs from emotional intelligence. Good question. The latter is the important concept popularized by Dan Goleman's excellent book of the same name. That involves recognizing one's own emotions, as well as those of other people, becoming motivated, and handling relationships. Emotional prediction is yet another layer of communicating. It is the ability to predict ahead of time what someone's immediate or distant emotions will be in relation to something you will say or will do. You can then choose your own behavior accordingly. Most of your choices should and will have the goal of enhancing the other person's self-esteem, helping people to feel good about themselves. The goal is similar to Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, but the method is different. We are not talking about giving compliments. Nowadays, some overt compliments are obvious and raise people's suspicions about your motives. To win people's respect and affection, you must dig deeper into their psyche and locate the size and shape of their very fragile self-esteem. Once accomplished, you can accurately predict their emotions, respond with sensitivity, and make them feel connected to you. You will find that many of the following techniques are to enhance your own confidence and prestige. Now, you might think this is incongruent with the goal of helping others feel good about themselves. It is not, for this reason. As much as people would like everyone to respect them, they long for acceptance from someone they look up to. The need for this type of appreciation from higher-ups starts early. Preschoolers want approval from their parents. Kids want the admiration of their teachers. And teens crave acceptance by the cool crowd. Even as adults, people still yearn for recognition from those that they respect. When people revere you, your deference in dealing with them gives their self-esteem a powerful boost. And as you become more sensitive to their sometimes suppressed emotions, their affection and esteem can turn into genuine love for you. The two of you are connected. Part 1. Nine Little Tricks to Take the Hell Out of Hello and Put the Good in Goodbye. How to Have a One-of-a-Kind, Noticeably Outstanding Handshake No one disputes that people form a quick opinion of you the split second your image reaches their retina. I disagree, however, with the hackneyed adage, you never have a second chance to make a good first impression. 
Someone gets an intense second impression of you the moment your eyes lock and your bodies touch in a handshake. A weak handshake shouts, "Instant disconnect." Will Lipton, the former CEO of a very successful company in Greenwich, Connecticut, told me he once faced the very tough choice of hiring one of two candidates who were equally qualified for a top position. When I asked him who got the job, he replied, "The one with a better handshake." Nowadays, most enlightened people know that they should not be knuckle crunchers, dead fish floppers, fingertip grabbers, pumpers, or kiss my ring shakers. So in the past few years, no one handshake really stood out as special, until last month, after a speech I had given for General Motors Canada, the president and managing director shook my hand. Whoa, Mr. Elias! I thought that is one heck of a handshake. It was strong and friendly, and it created a connection that I hadn't felt since my Girl Scout secret handshake. I couldn't figure out why his. Had such tremendous power. I had highlighted the importance of handshakes in my speech, so I felt comfortable complimenting his. Arthur Elias smiled. He turned his wrist over and pointed to the vein where the doctor takes your pulse. Leo, it's all right here, he said. Whenever I shake someone's hand, I lightly place my pointing finger on their pulse. In a sense, this is touching the shake ease heart. Because a person's pulse is a wave of blood traveling directly from the heart, I was instantly converted, and now I am a shameless pulse presser. Recently, a Freemason told me that the group has twenty handshakes, the highest one, the lion's paw of the master mason, involves pressure on a brother's pulse, so it is obviously recognized as big time stuff. When you get used to it, you will become sensitive to the connection your new handshake makes with your shakey. Little trick number one: press their pulse when shaking hands. Whenever shaking hands with someone, do not press like you are taking his pulse, but to create that instant connection with a new acquaintance. Ever so lightly, place your forefinger on his wrist vein, so he feels the warmth of your body flowing into his. Incidentally, sliding your hand into his far enough to reach his pulse forces your webs to touch. That's another sign of a great handshake. How to exchange business cards with class. At one of our monthly Chamber of Commerce meetings, the coordinator introduced me to Gakuto, the head of a Japanese business association. We chatted a bit, and then, as people promptly do at such gatherings, he handed me his business card. I glanced at it, thanked him, and put it in my purse. I then gave him mine. He gently took it, and holding it with both hands, gazed at it as though it were made of fragile Japanese rice paper. Golly, Gakuto! I thought it's just a business card. You can put it away now. I must admit, though, I rather liked the attention he was giving it. The way he kept gazing at it made me feel important. In fact, when I broke the silence, it seemed to shatter his concentration. Gakuto pulled his eyes away from my card almost reluctantly, and we continued chatting. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed he was still holding my card with both hands. To me, it represented respect and continued curiosity about my work. I suddenly felt a closer connection to this man who had taken my card so seriously. He even glanced at it again once or twice while we were talking. Talk about making me feel special. The Japanese may not be touchy feely with people, but they sure are with business cards. These polite people call it meishi. The word has the cachet of the ceremonial aspect of exchanging your business cards. I'm sure Gakuto wasn't thinking of his actions as a little trick. He was simply following the Asian tradition of treating someone's business card respectfully. Well, I figured you don't need to be Japanese to get away with holding someone's business card with respect with two hands, so I gave it a try. It created an almost tangible connection with the next few people that I met. Little trick number two: hold their business card while chatting. 
Don't just glance at a new acquaintance's business card and quickly stash it into your pocket or purse. First, hold it with both hands and gaze at it as though it were a small piece of art, hand painted especially for you. Then you can switch to holding the card with one hand, but continue holding it at waist level or just below. To make her feel even more esteemed and valued, give it a respectful glance from time to time. How to be cool giving your business card. Just as the choreography of taking someone else's card is significant, demonstrate respect for your own when giving it to someone. You needn't ceremoniously bestow it, but neither should you shove it at the recipient like a worthless piece of cardboard stock. I've seen people exchange cards as though they were dirty Kleenexes. Keep your cards in an attractive card case and handle them carefully. Think of your business card as the Japanese do. You are giving someone a representation of yourself. It shows that you take pride in your profession. Little trick number three. Present your card with pride. When giving your card, take it out of an attractive carrying case gently and present it horizontally with the script facing the recipient. Hold it just a bit higher than usual, not in his face, but at a height where he could almost read it in your hands. If you respect your work, others will too. After all, people who love the work they do and do the work they love are big winners in life. How to be a successful networking conversationalist. That same evening, I discovered another big bonus of holding someone's business card while conversing. It's also a boost for being a successful networking conversationalist. The coordinator introduced me to a gruff auto parts dealer. As is the custom at these meetings, I handed him my business card. He quickly eyeballed it and stuffed it into his back pocket, which, of course, would be a grave insult to an Asian. But practicing my new skill, I continued to hold Mr. Auto Parts' card respectfully, and I glanced at it occasionally. Understandably, my not knowing an air filter from a clutch constricted our conversation. And if I told him I was a motivational speaker, his first thought would have been the speakers in his car stereo. In other words, we were from different worlds. Unfortunately, fate and the coordinator had sentenced us to struggling with a few seconds of convivial conversation. But neither of us could think of anything to say. We just stood there looking at each other. To break the awkward moment, I tried my brand new card trick. Once again, I looked at Mr. Auto Parts' business card, which I was still holding in my hands. Bingo! It was pure conversation inspiration. Under his company name, I saw a photo of a circle shaped gizmo with six little thingamajiggies protruding from it. Um, interesting card, I fibbed. Uh, what's the picture? His deadpan expression suddenly dissolved. A big smile replaced it. A distributor cap, he exclaimed excitedly. Phew, I had inadvertently hit on a subject that he was passionate about. Um, and what does a distributor cap do, I asked. I know, it was pretty lame. But it got us through a couple of minutes of conversation until we could gracefully split and move on to more pertinent conversation with other people. Little trick number four. Examine their business card for conversation inspiration. When talk lags, look at their card again, which of course you are still holding. It can rescue you from discussion deadlock. Even if his card doesn't have an interesting photo, you will likely find a conversational clue on the card. His logo, his title, or maybe the mission statement. Small business owners often design their own cards. There, staring right at you, is another opening for an interesting story, or one that they find interesting at least. If appropriate, you could comment on an unusual title on her card. During the past year, I have been able to resuscitate near-death conversation by asking, what exactly does a electroplater or a phrenologist and, I kid you not, an erection coordinator do? My favorite card had Top Dog as the job title. How to give or avoid social hugs. We've talked about handshakes. Now let's move on to social hugs, an extremely controversial subject. 
Most of us have been hugged by people we loathe and left unhugged by people we love. At this very moment, serial huggers are attacking hug haters, while hug haters are hurting hug cravers by not hugging them. In short, to hug or not to hug has become something of a national dilemma. It's one that can turn otherwise genial greetings into a social disaster. I take no stand on the divisive hug issue, but offer instead some hugging hints. First, here is a self-defense move for hug haters. When someone approaches you with arms outstretched and a big glowing jack-o'-lantern smile, it is obvious that you are the intended victim of a hugger. Short of faking a soggy sneeze, there are few defensive moves. You can try averting the impending embrace by thrusting your right hand out and dangling it in midair as though it were hungry for a shake. Unfortunately, this is an obvious hug evasion technique, which makes the hugger feel instantly disconnected from you. My advice, medical or significant psychological conditions aside, is to grin and bear it. To date, no one has ever died from a hug. Now, here is a note for happy huggers. Most likely, you are a people person, and you sincerely enjoy bodily contact. You wish you were an octopus so you could hug four people at the same time. Many of your fellow embracers tell me a hug is a handshake from the heart. Unfortunately, not everyone agrees. So shall I swear off hugging, you ask? No, of course not. But let the other person adjudicate whether to be a shaker or a hugger. If she does not welcome your imminent display of affection, you can usually tell by her body language and, in extreme cases, terrified eyes. So here's the move. When you spot her, open your arms wide, but keep your elbows close to your waist. If your intended huggy welcomes your embrace, she will slide into your low-slung welcoming arms. If not, she will grab your right hand, which is still open at waist level, and shake it. Relieved that you are not one of those effusively invasive hugging types. Little trick number five. Let them choose whether to hug or to shake. Huggers, please, camouflage your hugging intentions by keeping your elbows almost touching your waist as you open your arms. That permits your potential huggy to make the call of whether to slide into your embrace or grab your right hand and give it a shake or two. Oh, and a final warning to both camps. Beware of giving or receiving promiscuous hugs too early. Once you have established that you have a hugging relationship, withholding the embrace in subsequent encounters could be confusing at best, cruel at worst. How to detect if someone's hug is fake? It is my obligation to alert you that some hugs carry heavy, negative emotional baggage. How can you tell? Ponder for a moment a sincere hug. That's the kind grandma gives her grandchildren and long-lost friends share when reunited. Both loving spouses celebrating their anniversary and young people discovering the joy of love express their emotions with a sincere hug. There is, unfortunately, another kind of hug. I call it the I really don't enjoy hugging you hug. That's the kind colleagues at industry conventions who don't even remember each other's names annually impose on each other. It's the obligatory kind that people give distant relatives that they never knew they had at family reunions. And, of course, the kind you see cutthroat competing employees bestow upon each other at company Christmas parties. What is the difference between the first group of hugs and the second? The distance that the huggers stand from each other? Sometimes. The tightness of the squeeze? Usually. But here is where the rubber really hits the road in hugging sincerity. Uncomfortable huggers pat each other's backs. Say someone throws his arms around you, but a few seconds later his hands transmogrify into flippers on your back. This indicates that he is uncomfortable hugging you for one reason or another, and it mitigates the authenticity of the hug. His hand flapping discloses discomfort with your closeness. Do not always assume that back patting is negative, though. Without knowing the particulars of a relationship, precise analysis is seldom possible. 
Here are a few situations, however, where people often employ the patter's hug. First, two gentlemen who wish to express friendship, but they want to make it quite clear to each other they are not physically enjoying the hug. How do they do it? They thump their hands on each other's backs. Two, mutual back patting by two women also expresses discomfort with the closeness, but it doesn't convey the same fear of misunderstood sexual orientation. Finally. A man and a woman. Now it gets very complicated. Four possibilities follow. One, if the male and female like each other but are not sexually attracted to each other, they immediately begin patting to convey their erotic disinterest. Two, if one of them would like to take the relationship further but the other wouldn't, the person who starts patting is signaling lack of sexual attraction, while the disappointed other. Pats back to show that he or she supposedly doesn't care. Three, the two are sexually attracted to each other, but feel they shouldn't be enjoying the hug that much, so they release anxiety through mutual back patting. Four, ex-lovers, when they run into each other, they usually start with a sincere hug, but when it dawns on them that the relationship is over, or that their new partners are watching, they start patting. Little trick number six: Don't ever pat when you hug. Stay in the embrace as long or as short as the situation and the hugging partner warrant, but do not let your hands become flippers on her back, lest it subliminally signal that you want to disconnect. Now, don't go crazy analyzing it if your co-hugger starts patting your back. It commonly occurs when one of the huggers feels the embrace is lasting too long. He or she is simply signifying, "Okay, time's up. Let's end this hugging thing." So, whenever you feel hands patting your back, smile and smoothly curtail the hug. I hope the foregoing hasn't stripped the joy of hugging away from huggers, forced hug haters to grin and bear agonizing embraces, or made you suspicious of everyone who hugs you. All I mean to say is. Be sensitive to the vast difference in people's reactions to hugs and act accordingly. Now I want to give you a safer one-size-fits-all embracing option. It is a subtle, non-offensive gesture that clearly says to an acquaintance, "I want to hug you, but perhaps it's not appropriate." How to show you like someone without being forward? One evening at a gathering, I was telling an elderly gentleman a tale that proves that cats don't have nine lives. At least mine didn't. Sadly, Sedgwick fell out of a sixth-floor window. Now, most males might consider the narrative schmaltzy, but this gentleman's hand reached out to touch my arm in compassion. Halfway, however, it seemed he thought better of it. His arm stopped in midair, and he respectfully pulled it back. Thus, giving me the impression that his instinct was to touch me affectionately, but in spite of his compassion for my deceased cat, his respect for me won out. Thus, another little trick was conceived. Little trick number seven: Reach out as though you are going to touch someone, but stop in midair and return your arm to its original position. It is a subtle technique, and when executed innocently, is lovely. You make the recipient feel you revere them, but you don't want to express your warmth in any untoward manner. Incidentally, it's a great technique for lovers or those who want to be lovers. Men use this move on a female friend who you would like to make more than a friend. She may appreciate your affection, but can't accuse you of being too forward. Needless to say, the only acceptable body parts for the no-contact caress are the arm, or on rare occasions, the cheek. Women, it works wonderfully on men. Their fantasies go wild, wondering what it means. While we're on this subject, let me tell you there are times when you should touch, or at least not avoid it. For many centuries in India, people in the lowest class were called dalits or untouchables. The upper class wanted no physical contact with them whatsoever. Salespeople have told me that's how they feel when a customer flings money on the counter for them to scoop up. When paying for something, put the money directly in the salesperson's hand. That and concurrent eye contact silently says, "For this brief second, you and I are connecting." 
How to Develop Excellent Eye Contact in 8 Easy Steps Now we can't leave the subject of body language when talking to strangers without mentioning eye contact, the most obvious and sometimes most difficult way people express their connection to each other. Ever since Mommy yanked you out from hiding behind her skirts and told you to look people in the eyes, you've known how crucial it is in the Western world. Yet for many, the most difficult aspect of meeting people is looking into their eyes long enough to really connect with them. Why is this a challenge, even for some self-assured people? Because, like two tigers staring each other down in the jungle, intense eye contact ignites a primitive fight-or-flight instinct. If one of the tigers looks away, he could get pounced on. Weak eye contact is a handicap in the human jungle, too. So here is an eight-step physical therapy program to strengthen your eye contact. Number one, take note of the color of his eyes. It seems obvious, but we've often known people for years and can't accurately describe the color. In fact, right now, stop for a second and think of a few friends. Can you picture the precise color of their eyes? When talking with, say, a woman, describe the color of her eyes to yourself. Don't stop at blue or brown. There are sapphire pale and ice blue eyes. Brown eyes can be hazel, almond, or earthy. Gray eyes can range from light slate to dark storm cloud. Now, number two, check out the shape of her eyes. Are they round, oval, almond? How much of the whites of her eyes are showing? And how white are they? Are they a little bloodshot? Here is another crutch for the eye contact challenge. Number three, study how far apart her eyes are. Ask yourself, if she loaned me her binoculars, would I have to separate the eyepieces or bring them together? Number four, are her eyes symmetrical? Is one eye a little smaller or droopier than the other? Number five, another time, concentrate on the length of her eyelashes. Are they straight? curly, what color are they? Now here's an interesting observation to make. When you are with a small group, watch the person's eyes to determine whom he is looking at most. When extended eye contact is called for, such as when someone is speaking to a small group, number six, count his blinks. A study reported in the Journal of Research and Personality called The Effects of Mutual Gaze on Feelings of Romantic Love proved that people who are directed to count each other's eye blinks during a conversation develop stronger romantic feelings for each other than the members of a control group who are given no eye contact directions. Here are a few more ways to train yourself to become more comfortable with maintaining excellent eye contact. Number seven, try to determine if he is wearing contact lenses and are the lenses colored or clear. Now, number eight is for women only. Determine how much eye makeup another female is wearing. How much mascara, shadow, eyeliner. Stop laughing, gentlemen. We women do that naturally. If you practice these techniques, looking into someone's eyes will gradually become natural and less daunting without depending on these crutches. To recap, here is little trick number eight. Examine eight characteristics of their eyes. To boost your eye contact with people, alternate between defining the color, shape, and whites of their eyes. Check out the length and color of their lashes. Are they wearing contact lenses or glasses? How far apart are their eyes? Count their blinks. Ladies, check out another woman's eye makeup. Is she wearing false eyelashes? Meow. After a few rounds of doing this exercise, looking into people's eyes will be a breeze. Strong eye contact will become second nature. Incidentally, this eye contact technique is especially effective when you are listening to someone talking to a group. Your intense eye contact coming out of the small crowd makes a big impression on the speaker. Oh, and in case I forgot, when you're speaking one-on-one -on -one with someone, don't forget to pay attention to what she is saying, too. How to meet the people you want to meet. I must log this following little trick under a heading called The Ignored Obvious. You would think everyone would do it every time they attended a meeting, a seminar, or any event that has a group of seated people. 
Yet in all my years of speaking for groups, I have seldom noticed anyone consciously performing little trick number nine. The usual pattern is this: the first person to arrive at the seminar or seated gathering sits in the right rear of the room. The next arrival sits in the left front. The next, the left rear, and so on. Each person sits as far from the other participants as possible until all the seats are filled. Then, during the break in single seminars, I often notice a male audience member eyeing a female across the room, or vice versa. Now, unless one of them is blessed with that rare quality called complete confidence, they are never going to meet. But if only one had chosen a chair next to the other, sparks could have ignited. Ditto in corporate programs. Employees must know the advantage of sitting next to a VIP. Let's call him a big cat in their own company, or at conventions, somebody in the industry who could be important to them. But what surprises me is that I never see a participant walk in ten minutes early and wait by the wall to see where other people are sitting before choosing their chair. So here's the plan: be among the first to arrive at a large industry. Company or social presentation. However, do not choose your seat yet. Stand at the side of the room and eyeball everyone who comes in. When you spot your target person, pretend the music just stopped in a game of musical chairs. Then sprint right to the seat next to Mister or Ms. Opportunity. Little trick number nine: hover around to see where someone you want to meet sits first. If you are seeking any important alliance—romantic, social, business—arrive early at the gathering and hover around the sides like a helicopter. Then, when you spot that important someone, make a speedy landing in the seat right next to him or her. Remember, where you deposit your bottom can change your bottom line. Part two: Ten little tricks. To develop an extraordinary gift of gab. How to make people appreciate your introduction? No two people hearing the same words at the same time from the same person ever get the same sense of what someone said. Every sound that comes out of a speaker's mouth strikes a minefield of each listener's buried memories, associations, and a lifetime of emotional pleasure. Or pain from everybody they've ever met. Even the order of words in a single sentence can affect how someone feels about the person who is talking. For example, I've often heard a man introduce his wife, "I'd like you to meet my wife, Wilma," or a wife say, "This is my husband, Harold." Now most people would ask, "What's wrong with that?" Can you guess? It will be obvious after I tell you about a big-headed former boss I once had. Whenever this man introduced me, he would arrogantly announce, "This is my assistant, Leo." Once it was, "This is my assistant, um, um, Leo." The facts were correct. I was indeed his assistant. What stung was the order of his words. He said it as though his first four words were the only essential ones, and the last word, my name, was optional. Would it have hurt his self-image to think of me as a human being whom he employed as his assistant, rather than any featherless biped who could fill that role? I wished he'd dismount his high horse just once to predict how the way he worded his sentence made me feel demeaned and disconnected from him. People would have a different impression of both of us if he had said, "This is Leo, my assistant," putting my name first. I know you're thinking, "Whoa, back up, Leo! You're being way too sensitive." My answer is that everybody is super sensitive when it comes to themselves. I'm sure old Mr. Bighead didn't mean to demean me; he just didn't have the emotional prediction that the CEO in the introduction had. That CEO would have surely said, "Meet Leo, comma pause, my assistant," putting my name before my position. When you are introducing someone, don't say "Meet my boyfriend Harold." Say "Meet Harold, my boyfriend." Don't say "I'd like to introduce you to my wife Wilma." Replace the subconscious pain prick with a pleasure pat of hearing "Wilma, comma my wife." If it's not something simple like my wife, stop after saying her name. 
then start a new sentence heralding her relationship to you. I dreamed of hearing Mr. Pompa say, I'd like to introduce you to Lil. She is my assistant who's been working for me for three months. And, of course, I wouldn't have minded if he insisted on adding, and I really like working with her. That comment would have made people like him more. Shakespeare told us, All the world loves a lover. He forgot to add, All the world likes a liker. Little trick number ten. When introducing someone, say their name before their role in your life. It's subtle. It's subliminal. It takes superior sensitivity. But it's worth it. Your prediction of other people's even subconscious feelings make them feel good, not only about themselves, but about you. They probably wouldn't even be aware of whether their name came before or after their position. They'll just know they feel better when they're around you. How to get lively conversation going with people you've just met. People with the gift of gab had that Midas touch of being able to say howdy to strangers and chit-chat with anyone. Their most noticeable quality is how quickly they connect with the dozens of people we all encounter daily. Sales clerk, ticket agents, taxi drivers, telephone operators, fellow elevator passengers, and a whole world of others. Long, animated conversations with people they have just met seem effortless to them. When you also are adept at turning these strangers into acquaintances, and those you fancy into friends, you will know you are a graduate in the gift of gab. But, you ask, what shall I talk about with these strangers? Well, psychiatrists have an annoying habit of always answering a question with another question. So I'm giving myself a promotion now, and Dr. Lowndes will do the same. My answer to your question is this question. What is everyone's favorite subject? Right, it's themselves. But you already knew that. But if you don't know them, you can't just say, Hi, tell me about yourself. However, let me tell you how one stranger got me talking about myself in spite of the miserable mood I was in. In one hour, this woman transformed me from a stranger to a friend. I'll always be grateful to my long-distance pal, Cheryl Mostrom, for inspiring this next little trick, which you can use with anyone you meet, anytime, anywhere. She turned a grumpy stranger me into a gabber. One icy February day five years ago, I had a pre-dawn flight from New York to Phoenix for a speech. At 4 a.m. when my alarm went off, I contemplated hurling it out the bedroom window, but lest it rub out some passerby, I decided against it. There was no time for breakfast at the airport, and these days an airline meal is an oxymoron. My seatmates were a howling infant and his mom, so sleeping was not an option. As I watched the flight attendant pass out one puny packet of peanuts per passenger, I considered filching the jar of pureed apricot from the kid's baby bag. Then changing planes at Midway Airport, I raced to the connection gate a good half a mile away, just in time to sit on the plane for an hour while they de-iced the wings. After a bumpy takeoff, the flight attendant passed out barf bags instead of peanuts. The Arrival As often happens, the event coordinator, whom I hadn't yet met, picked me up at the airport. Now, meeting planners usually ask the obligatory, How is your flight? before moving on to grill me on every aspect of the program that I planned for them. But this time, Cheryl, from the law firm of Fenimore Craig, who up until then was just a slight phone acquaintance, said, You must have gotten up terribly early this morning. What time did your alarm go off? She then inquired whether I'd had time to eat at the airport or if they'd served anything to me on the plane. On our walk to the car, she asked questions like, Were the gates close together in Chicago where you changed planes? Was there much turbulence? Were you able to sleep on the plane? It was as though Cheryl had been filming me since the moment I staggered into my pre-dawn shower. Had she seen me racing through the airport corridor at breakneck speed? Did she feel me itching to hurl my shoes at the security man who made me take them off? I was flabbergasted at her sensitive queries because she only knew three facts. One, I took an early flight. Two, I had to change planes in snowy Chicago. And three, the flight was an hour late. 
From those few clues, Cheryl envisioned what I'd gone through and realized I would want to get it off my chest. She demonstrated emotional prediction at its finest, and I felt an instant bond with her. If Cheryl hadn't asked those on-target questions as she drove me to the hotel, I would have still been silently grousing about my miserable trip. Instead, by the time we got there, we were both laughing about my flight from hell. I would have performed my entire speech in the car for her if it would have set her heart at rest. After I got to know Cheryl better, I complimented her on her insight about my experiences before I arrived. She said, Leal, it's the same thing you did when you sent me your pre-programmed questionnaire. Now, a pre-programmed questionnaire is a list of questions speakers send to clients so they can get to know the organization better before speaking for them. One of the crucial queries on the questionnaire is, what has the participant's day been like up until the speech? I haven't seen Cheryl, who lives 2,000 miles away, after that day we met five years ago, but we have remained phone and email friends ever since. This little trick is based on an irrefutable phenomenon in nature. Anything up close looks larger than when it is at a distance. This is true for experiences as well as objects. For example, I didn't feel Cheryl's questions about my alarm clock or the proximity of the airport gates was small talk. Not at all. These hassles were still a big deal to me. I enjoyed getting them off my chest. So here is the technique to get interesting conversations started. Well, at least interesting to the other person. When you first meet someone, you know next to nothing about them. However, with very little effort, you can find out some trivial facts about his day. It can be as simple as asking someone at a party where he lives. If he lives at a distance, ask about his long drive. Ask questions like, was there much traffic? Were you driving on a highway or country roads? What is the speed limit on those roads? It may sound silly to you, but this is not small talk to him. Why? Because these details are still on his mental windshield. The proximity makes them loom larger in his mind than they really are. Inquiring about the traffic and speed limit the next day would seem trifling, even weird. But at this moment, it is relevant conversation for him. Questions about someone's last few hours just kickstart the conversation. Soon the natural flow takes over and one subject leads to another. So take any seed of information you've gleaned. If you plant it and nurture it, you will be amazed at how quickly it turns into an animated discussion. The technique works wonderfully with friends, too. Let's say it's Wednesday. Your friend knows what time she woke up. She knows what challenges she faced at work, where she had lunch, what she ate and with whom, and lots of other forgettable stuff. To you or any of her other friends, these facts are diddly squat. However, they played a significant role in her Wednesday. That evening, she will love talking about them. By Thursday, she's forgotten Wednesday's details, so asking about them would sound pandering and foolish. For good conversation, catch someone's trivia while it's hot. The upcoming little trick 11 isn't just for creating good conversation, though. Since close friends are the only ones who talk about trivia with each other, chatting about your new acquaintance's minutia gives the cachet of already being closely connected. Soon after I discovered how well this little trick works on acquaintances and friends, I decided to see if it also works on people you see all the time, like a family member or someone you live with. Now, the high price of real estate in New York City necessitates some unusual living arrangements. So I have a male friend, Phil Perry, as a roommate. I call him my platonic male roommate. He says we're friends without benefits. It's the same thing. Now, Phil likes to take long, leisurely walks through the city on Sunday mornings. When he returned from one of his walks, I asked him dozens of tiny details, anything I could think of. Phil, how was the temperature? Did you see many people on the street, or was it deserted? Were there any stores open? Did you stop for breakfast? Where? What did you eat? Phil didn't find my query strange. He loved talking about his just-completed stroll, so much that I had trouble changing the subject. So here it is, little trick number 11. Ask people about their last few hours. 
To get a new acquaintance or an old friend talking, ask about her day, preferably the last five or six hours. Visualize as many details as you can think of and ask about them. As far-fetched as it seems to you, she's loving it because she is so close to the experience. But remember, each particular question has a short shelf life, so use it while it's hot. The formula is simple, and the conversational payoff is huge. How to start a friendship with complete strangers. Naturally, if you have time to spend with someone after being introduced, you can more easily lay the foundation for a friendship. In today's fast-paced world, however, that's a tough task. Say you have a quick conversation with a receptionist at an organization you're visiting, and you'd like to get to know her better. Or you meet a man at a gathering who works in tech support at a nearby company. But your time to make a connection is short. Turning your brief acquaintance into a friend is a challenge. However, if you plan it well, the following technique accomplishes just that. Soon after saying hello, bring up a subject, any subject, that you could logically follow up with another question. For instance, ask for nearby restaurant recommendations, driving directions, where to buy something. Ask her what movies she suggests. Get his advice on which home computer you should buy. Think of something that you might just need more information on later. Asking for recommendations is good for two reasons. The next day, you could pretend to have quote forgotten what movie she suggested and just have to call her again. If you have Mr. Tech Support's number, it is perfectly reasonable to contact him again. You can ask for suggestions on where you should buy the computer. Find a logical reason to contact the previous stranger a third time. After seeing the movie or buying the computer, call to say thank you for the excellent advice. In the case of the receptionist nearby, you could even stop in to thank her in person. The secret is setting up those follow-up contacts during the first conversation. They promote you from stranger to acquaintance, and that is the first step to becoming a friend. Now the next step. If you would like to orchestrate a friendship where you do things together, use the second or third conversation to get your new acquaintance talking about his or her interests. Then find a related situation that could involve an invitation. Does he like theater, Indian food, horror movies? After several short phone conversations, your invitation to an event in that genre seems very logical. The receptionist told you she likes movies. There's your opportunity when a new one opens. The techie who recommended your computer would be pleased if you just happened to have two tickets to the technology expo when it comes to town. Incidentally, I am not concentrating on dating here. A myriad of other factors, which I thoroughly cover in my program, how to make anyone fall in love with you, are involved in creating that special kind of relationship. We are primarily talking about friendship here. Little trick number twelve: set it up to make a second contact. Get your acquaintance talking about a subject that has a logical follow-up question. Then contact her again for further information. As long as it relates to what you talked about, there is nothing strange about getting in touch a second time or a third. Now you are on the path to friendship. Another fun little trick for going from stranger to acquaintance. Noah Webster, the dictionary guy, never came across a common word that practically every twenty-first century person knows, at least those in the northeastern United States. It traces its roots to a Germanic language that developed in the tenth century. Are you curious? Drum roll, please. The word is shtick. Shtick is defined as a quote contrived bit of business often used by performers. Now I'm not talking about your Uncle Charlie's shtick of spinning a plate on his finger or pulling a quarter out of your ear. I'm referring to a more subtle spoken shtick that has the power to make people smile, to lift their day, and to feel an instant connection with you. Many people we see daily are in service professions, such as the cashier at your favorite coffee shop or the counter person at Taco Bell. Employees serving the public often plow through their day. Feeling anonymous and nameless, here's how to brighten their day 
and practice your gift of gab at the same time. Give people a shtick name. Now, a shtick name is similar to a nickname, but you create it from a pleasant experience you've had with that person, or it can just be a flattering nickname. Let's say you happen to know that the Italian word for beautiful is bella. Now, the cashier at your regular coffee shop is Italian American. You could get her day off to a great start hearing your cheerful ciao bella, which means hello beautiful, in the morning. Let's say that at Taco Bell you always order a half pound beef and bean burrito with cheesy fiesta potatoes. One time, the guy at the counter started preparing this delicacy the minute he saw you. Your shtick can be calling him Kreskin, the famous mind reader. I have a shtick name for the receptionist at my doctor's office. I once had a sharp pain in my neck, a real one, not the kind some people give us. I called my doctor's office and asked to speak to Dr. Carter. Camille Mazzotti, the receptionist, answered. As I was describing the pain, she asked me very astute medical questions. Then she said, "Of course, Leo. The doctor can call you back. However, she's with a patient now, and I know what she might suggest. May I tell you?" "Sure, Camille," I said. I followed her advice, and the soreness disappeared. So, what is the shtick we both have fun with? Every time I speak to her, I call her Doctor Camille. I know she enjoys the professional promotion, and I enjoy making her smile. Now, there's a "what's in it for me" factor. As with most of the little tricks in this program that enhance people's self-esteem, there is something nice in this one for you too. Let's go back to the coffee shop. Whoops! You left your wallet at home today. Bella is not going to insist you pay for it now, or maybe ever. Darn! At Taco Bell, there is an unusually long line. Well, Kreskin might just work his magic. He will place your order the minute you walk in the door. Incidentally, Doctor Camille always finds a way to fit me into my doctor's very fully booked schedule. What about your friends? It's not just the English who go bonkers over titles. Everybody loves having one. Does your friend Patrick teach you things? Call him Professor Patrick. Does your friend Stephanie do good things for people? She is Saint Stephanie. Depending on his qualities, your buddy John can be Sir John, Father John, Prince John, Master John, or Captain John. Your friend Linda can be Lady Linda, Lieutenant Linda, Sister Linda, or even Princess Linda. Their honorable titles are only limited by your imagination and by the qualities your friends would love to have recognized. Little trick number thirteen. Give people a shtick name. If you think someone will enjoy it, give him a flattering nickname. It makes you memorable, and at very least, it gives you both a smile. There is one fundamental shtick rule, however: it must augment the recipient's self-esteem. How to make friends with those who don't speak your native language? One of my short-term roommates, until she found her own apartment, was Sandy Fiorentino. She had come to New York to pursue a career in modeling. At five foot ten, with natural platinum blonde hair that most models would die for, the prestigious Ford agency scooped her up. Sandy was ecstatic because her first shoot was on the Italian Riviera. She could practice the language she'd been struggling for years to learn from her Italian grandmother. When she returned from her trip, she breathlessly told me all about it. Naturally, I asked the same question that every unmarried female asks another: Did you meet anybody interesting? Now, Sandy could have met the ten most fascinating women in Italy, but as every female knows, anybody interesting translates into any interesting men. Sandy smiled coyly. John Carlo, I mean, he is super cool, awesome. How did you meet him, Sandy? She giggled. He picked me up on the beach. Wow, Sandy, he must have been really hot. Well, no, she said. A lot of other guys tried, but I couldn't understand a word they said. But for some reason, I understood Giancarlo perfectly, and we wound up dating every night. When he comes to visit me, I'll introduce you. Well, the hot Italian did come to New York. And when I met John Carlo, I mentioned that Sandy told me he was the first man she understood speaking Italian. He winked at me and said very, very slowly, 
parlo molto lentamente per gli stranieri. Even with my abysmally fractured Italian, I understood what he was saying. I speak very slowly to foreigners. Go, Giancarlo. The fast movers on the beach didn't get the gorgeous girl. The slow speaker did. He understood how people feel when they don't understand a language that they're trying to learn. Little trick number 14. Speak slowly for non-native speakers. In our increasingly global society, you will meet more and more people for whom English is a second language. For them to understand you, you must slow your speech down, way down. Of course it will sound strange to you, but I promise it won't to your listener. To connect with non-native people, you need to learn a new, very simple language. It's called, really, 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 slowly, spoken, English. How to tailor your talk to your listeners. I once spoke at a conference in a less advantaged section of Mississippi with a prominent African-American speaker, Diana Parks. She is a dynamic woman who is beautifully spoken. So during her presentation, I couldn't believe my ears when I heard her say things like, he don't know, and they done it. After our speeches, I tentatively broached the subject with her. She just laughed and said, Lil, I grew up here. These are my people. They relate to me better that way. I guess she was right. My speech had bombed, and Diana received a standing ovation. It wouldn't have been appropriate, of course, for me to try to speak like Diana. In retrospect, however, I realize I should have edited my talk somewhat to avoid using any unusual words. It was so obvious, after the fact, when in Rome, speak like the Romans. I felt ashamed of not having predicted the emotions of audience members who didn't understand some of my so-called big words. Sometimes you should leave your big words in the dictionary. If you're a five-syllable kind of guy, cut your words to fewer than three syllables in certain crowds. You will make your listeners a lot more comfortable. For example, if you're having a fight with an average Joe and you tell him not to prevaricate because his argument is specious, you'll get a blank stare, maybe a punch in the gut. Translate this into his language. Tell him, don't try to pull that on me. I know what you're saying is BS. It's similar to what you would do speaking with a child. If you are talking about, say, cartoons, you wouldn't ask, do you like the anthropomorphic ones? You'd get a blank stare maybe tears. Instead, ask, do you like the cartoons where animals talk and act like people? A study published in the Journal of Psychonomic Science showed that if you are, quote, above someone else, in this case, linguistic ability, anything you do that brings you down to his level makes him feel closer to you. Little trick number 15. Match your words to their educational level. Diversity isn't just race, color, and creed. It's linguistic, too, even though it's all the same language. If you want to really connect with people, tailor your vocabulary to your listeners, whether it's one person or a thousand. How to talk to less advantaged people. On the average, people make three aborted takeoffs on a career before getting off the ground and reaching a cruising speed with one they like. Single-handedly, I probably jacked up the average from three attempts to twelve. One of my ditched efforts was as a travel writer. I had fantasies of mountain trekking in Thailand or lying on the beach in Belize, all for free. After querying many publications, I finally received a response from a supermarket tabloid. It didn't matter to me that it wasn't a literary publication. I didn't care that my stories would be sandwiched between recipes for squash soup and how to survive Saturday at the mall with the kids. I had a travel assignment. The editor sent me a contract and a list of destinations I could explore on their dime. I anxiously tore open the envelope. The choices were Atlantic City, Disneyland, Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone National Park? You've got to be kidding. 
Where is the Mayan Riviera, Bali, Pango Pango, the places I'd read about in town and country, Atlantic Monthly, and Destinations magazines? I raced to the phone and asked my editor if there were any other more um, unusual spots. She said, "Leal, we have to stay within the parameters of the possible with our readers. Most of them couldn't afford to go to the Caribbean, let alone any more exotic destinations." Roar of thunder, flash of lightning! I got it. She was so right. I had shown an abysmal lack of emotional prediction. I still eat my heart out when I finger through those upscale magazines in my dentist's office, and I see exotic vacation spots I could never afford. Well, apparently my dentist can. I suddenly had more respect for that supermarket tabloid, and just as editors understand the lifestyle of their readers. We should understand the lifestyle of whomever we're talking with. Little trick sixteen: Don't speak of your haves with the have-nots. Never talk about a luxury that would be unobtainable for the person you are communicating with, whether it's a vacation spot, a second home, expensive restaurant, or a housekeeper. Predict their emotions when they hear about something in your fortunate life that probably will never be part of theirs. Many necessities of life to the middle class are unheard of luxuries to those in less privileged circumstances. Why remind them? Why distance yourself further? Keep your differences a secret and celebrate your similarities. Giancarlo, Diana, and my magazine editor had EP. They perceived how badly someone would feel not speaking the language they were trying to learn, having limited vocabulary, or living on less money. Now here's how an anonymous mom's EP saved me from a different kind of distress: total humiliation. How to save someone from dying of embarrassment? I want to hug all the people who have saved me from self-recrimination. Hundreds of them. My most recent salvation was several months ago on a train. I was trying to sleep, but I heard a kid behind me making a ruckus with a video game. Rather than just asking the mother to confiscate it, I figured I should make friends with a little loudmouth first, and then make my request. I turned around. The noisy kid with the shoulder-length brown hair had her nose buried in the game. Hi, I said. What game are you playing? Tomb Raider. She mumbled almost inaudibly without looking up. I pictured ghouls ransacking graves.、Uh, gee, that's nice. I lied. Do all the girls in school play these games? She looked at me as though I were from a different planet. Then she looked at her mother and dove back into the game. I asked her mother, "What's her name?" Ignoring my question, the mother smiled and jumped in with, "Yes, practically all of the kids have playstations. It seems like they're addicted to them." Then she added apologetically, "They are quite noisy, though. We'll turn it off for a while." Mission accomplished. Smiling, I turned around to sweet slumber. When I awoke, I got up to go to the restroom. As I was about to enter the bathroom, a boy wearing a baseball cap with Robert written on it came out. "Excuse me, ma'am," he said in an unmistakably male voice. On the way back, I passed the noisy kid's seat. Sitting in it was the same brown-haired kid wearing a Robert cap. "Ay, your daughter was a son," I realized. I snuck back into my seat, humiliated. In retrospect, I realized that Robert's mother had that priceless gift, emotional prediction. After I had mistakenly said all the girls and what's her name, she didn't reveal her kid's true gender by saying Robert. She knew how embarrassed I'd be and covered my obviously flawed question by quickly telling me about the popularity of the games. I wanted to hug her. We've all laid an occasional egg, mispronounced a word. Called someone by the wrong name, obviously displayed our misunderstanding or ignorance, said something totally inappropriate, or just plain dumb. When someone is guilty of that, you will see by his agonizing expression that he wants to die. You feel terrible for him, but mercy killings are illegal. The following may not be the most delicate analogy, but it is right on target. If you have ever passed gas when you are chatting with a group of people. You know that one second silence can seem like an hour. Project how the mortified person who passed verbal gas feels. 
make a rapid comment to cover his humiliation. Little trick number 17. Conceal their verbal blooper with an instantaneous comment. If the speaker says something that she may soon realize is mistaken, mispronounced, or just plain dumb, quickly jump in and cover it. Say something distracting rapidly so there is little time for it to dawn upon her that she has been a dimwit. Speaking of changing the subject, here is How to Smoothly Change the Subject. How many times have you been stuck in a conversation in which people are talking about something you know nothing about, care nothing about, or find just plain boring? But you can't jump into a new topic just out of the blue. It would sound weird. So how do you change the subject to something more interesting without sounding strange? First, let's explore the logical progression of conversation. Practically everything anyone says comes from free associating with something that the last person just said. Here's the pattern. 1. You make a comment that obviously relates to what person X just said. Number 2. After that, person X, or Y, picks up on a point related to what you just said. 3. You do the same again, and on it goes. It doesn't sound weird because your listeners understand the connection between the two thoughts. The pattern continues whether you are a group of two or twenty. In this way, one subject gradually and logically flows into another. But that's too slow for you. You want them to get off the current topic and change the subject now. Here's how to do it. If you want to discuss a specific subject, Pick up on something, a, a thought, a phrase, or even just a single word that the last speaker said. Now repeat or rephrase it, and then relate it to what you want to say. If you invoke their thought, and then link it even loosely to yours, the connection makes sense to the listeners. For example, do you want to talk about a recent movie you just saw, or your new horseback riding lessons? Or maybe you want to tell the group about the great renovations you're doing to your house. But darn, they're talking about the most tedious subject in the world, the weather. Let's say some wearisome woman complains about the downpour last Saturday. Another person adds, it's dreadful, it's raining every weekend. Now your challenge is to go from snore, the rain, to the movie you enjoyed. Here is how. In your first sentence, allude to rain. In your next, connect it to your desired topic. For example, say, on rainy weekends, I usually go to a movie. In fact, just last week I saw one called, and so forth. The transition sounds smooth to people because you mentioned rain and then said something related to it. If you prefer to talk about your horseback riding, say, I sure hope it doesn't rain next Saturday because I have my second horseback riding lesson. You want them to know about your home renovations? Say, I'm praying it does rain next weekend, because instead of taking the missus shopping, I'll have an excuse to stay home and keep on working on my new recreation room. You see, each time, you only had to say the word rain to logically link it to whatever subject you wanted to talk about. Changing the subject is a time-honored trick for politicians. Listen to any Sunday morning political TV talk show and count the number of times they pull it off. Little trick number 18. Echo their words and then link them to yours. To change the subject, repeat or rephrase the most recent speaker's words or idea. Then tie it to yours. If you include or allude to what someone else just said, people won't even notice that you've changed the topic. Of course, there are many times when you should not change the subject, no matter how boring it is for you. How to know when to never change the subject. One of my consulting clients instituted a new inventory control system and gave the entire company training on it. Nevertheless, months later, most of the employees were still stumped. All except one, that is, a quiet, nice-guy geek named Gunter. 
During one of the company's casual roundtable meetings, the CEO announced that Gunter had graciously offered to coach anyone who needed extra help on the new system. As Mr. Santos continued singing his praises, I peeked at Gunter. He was self-consciously looking at his lap, but I could tell he was bursting with pride, reveling in his boss's compliment. Santos continued, "I'm sure everyone is already grateful to Gunter." Several people have told me that whenever they had any trouble with their computer, Gunter would drop whatever he was doing and, before Santos could finish his sentence, however, one of the other employees jumped in with, "Well, some of the positions where the new computers have been put aren't really convenient. For instance," while the interrupting employee Devon droned on, the rest of Gunter's compliment was forgotten, by all except Gunter, that is. He had been savoring his verbal kiss until a man with a mental myopia cut his kudos short. If Devon had had one trickle of EP running through his veins, he would have never cheated Gunter out of the rest of his well-deserved recognition. Actually, it wasn't Gunter who lost the most that day. Should Devon's computer crash a few weeks later, how rapidly do you think Gunter would rush to his aid? It's not just for compliments. Not switching topics goes for many more situations than just when someone is being praised. Always keep your EP tuned to those around you. If you notice the subject of the moment is extremely enjoyable to anyone in the group, slap on the muzzle. Let's say you, Sarah, and a few others are sitting around someone's living room. The group is discussing Sarah's kids, Sarah's vacation, Sarah's anything else she especially enjoys talking about. No matter how boring the discussion is to you, do not change the subject. Let someone else do it. Sooner or later, they will. Let Sarah savor the current conversation until it dies a natural death, or someone else does the dirty changing the subject deed. Predict Sarah's displeasure if the subject abruptly gets changed, and her displeasure with the person who changed it. Little trick number nineteen. Never change a subject that someone else finds special. Never change the subject or leave when you sense the conversation is important or special to someone else in the group. Especially if others are applauding that person, let the last note of their accolade sink in. In fact, don't even be the first person to speak post compliment, unless, of course, it is to add your own refrain to their hymn of praise. Not so incidentally, even if you are not part of the conversation, don't leave the room during their thrilling repartee. It's tantamount to walking out on them personally. Part three: Six little tricks to actually enjoy parties. How to make friends at a big party? How many times have you heard, and maybe even said? I hate big parties where I don't know anyone. Plastered partygoers with lampshades on their heads have sputtered those same words. Even those in the stylish champagne-toasting crowd assert their aversion to big receptions. However, if you ask these same folks if they like intimate little gatherings where the guests know each other, oh, that's a different story. Yes, I love those. They say they're loads of fun. Awesome. Well, guess what? Even the biggest blowout starts out as a small party. I came upon this astounding verity quite by accident one day when I had to attend a large Sunday afternoon gathering where I didn't know anyone. The invitation said three o'clock. Planning to be stylishly late and therefore diminish my discomfort, I arrived at the hostess doorstep at three forty-five by my watch and rang the bell. Oh, Lil, do come in," the hostess said graciously, but obviously hiding irritation. Then she told me the last thing a nervous party goer wants to hear: "You're the first to arrive." Arr! She led me into her huge living room. Just make yourself comfortable. I'm going to finish a few things in the kitchen. Yeah, sure, I'll be comfortable. Ha!、Huh? Looking at her clock on the wall, I was horrified. I had forgotten to set my watch back on this very first day of daylight savings time. It was only two forty-five. A few minutes later, the doorbell rang. From the foyer, I heard the hostess say, "Brant, I'm so happy you could come." A male voice responded, 
I apologize I'm here so early. I figured I should get an early start, but there was no traffic coming over. Oh, it's a pleasure to see you any time, the hostess said. Let me introduce you to Lil. She was the first one here. Brent and I started chatting, and much to my delight, he and I really hit it off. As other people arrived, I felt like I was attending one of those awesome little gatherings where everybody knows each other. Soon people started coming in droves, and it turned into what I used to call a dreaded bash. This time, however, it was different. I already knew a lot of people, the other early arrivals. If I found myself feeling lonely and lost, I had my new friends, the other early birds, to talk to. Since they introduced me to their friends, like the ripple effect, my circle of acquaintances became larger and larger, and all because I'd forgotten to change my watch. It was a lucky mistake. I will never be fashionably late to a gathering where I don't know people again. Little trick number 20. Be unfashionably early. Every big function starts out as a little affair. So grit your teeth, swallow your instincts, and go early. Be among the first to arrive, and you will meet everybody who's already there. As the party gets bigger, you will have a group of people to hang with, and to introduce you to the other guests. Moms and dads, pay special attention to this part. When Judith McCarthy from McGraw-Hill, the most wonderful editor a writer could ever have, read this, she put one of those comment balloons that editors plaster all over writers' drafts. She wrote, Leal, this is so true. I once mistakenly went early to a family party with my kids. I sheepishly said to the hostess, I guess I'm very early, aren't I? My kids and her kids played, though, and I helped her get the food out. It went much better for my kids than if we had arrived on time. And Judith should know, she is a three-time mom. If you and your progeny are going to a gathering where there will be other kids, this little trick benefits your tots, too. No child wants to hear. Now, Rachel, go play with that rambunctious mob of kids over there. Arriving early is especially good advice for shy people. As a recovered shy myself, I know how arriving early goes against the grain. My mantra used to be, slip in late and sneak out early. Shies, I beseech you, try going to a party early just once. You will see how much more comfortable the whole party will be. Being unfashionably early also inspired another little trick. Have you ever stood at the sidelines wishing your outfit matched the wallpaper so no one would notice you? Or worse, been trapped alone in the middle of a laughing, talking throng with a drink in a plastic cup? When a partying passerby smiles at you, you assume she's smirking out of sympathy because you have no one to talk to. A friend of mine, Ebony, and I once arrived fashionably, but not beneficially, late to a gathering. Both she and I only knew about three other guests, although fortunately not the same ones. Walking in the door and confronting the unfamiliar crowd, I had an epiphany. I asked Ebony to introduce me to absolutely everyone she knew, and I would do the same for her. In addition, we agreed to introduce each other to anyone we met at the party. It worked beautifully. Little trick number 21. Make a cross-introduction pact. If you don't know many people at a party, make this pact with a buddy. Friend, I'll introduce you to everybody I know or meet, and you do the same for me. You might think this is obvious and will happen naturally, but I assure you, unless you sign a verbal treaty, it probably won't. Using this little trick, you will eventually meet everyone there. Do the arithmetic. I couldn't, but a mathematics professor, drawing on actuarial calculus, combinations, and probabilities, did it for me, and assured me it was true. You will eventually meet everyone there. How to meet people in an unusual way. At the beginning of a party, people will be straggling in, one by one or two by two. Some of the loners will zip toward their friends like metal shavings to a magnet. These folks are not your target for this little trick. The twosomes, 
and threesomes and foursomes who strut in confidently are not either. Some people entering alone, however, will creep in with that pasted-on smile that reveals anything from minor insecurity to major terror. Surprise these folks by giving them a big smile as they enter. They will figure that you either know them or you are dazzled by their magnificence. Either misunderstanding melts the snow and shovels a clear path right to your vicinity. When they arrive, they may not have the self-assurance to actually put their hand out and introduce themselves, but they will welcome your doing the deed. Think about it. If you were shivering in the doorway of a room full of strangers, wouldn't you want someone's smile to warm you? Little trick number 22. Smile at individuals entering alone. The minute they walk in the door of a party, give loners a sincere smile, the crow's feet kind that reaches your eyes. If they come over to you immediately, say, Oh, you look just like a good friend of mine. In fact, when you entered, I thought that's who it was. By the way, my name is... And introduce yourself. Even if they don't make a beeline directly toward you, be assured, like moths being drawn to a flame, your warmth will make them want to meet you. Some of you may think that that little trick was wacky. I assure you, it has been road-tested by friends who have generously agreed to be guinea pigs for my perverse research. Are you skeptical about it? Well, a friend of mine, Donna Vincent from New Jersey, is currently dating one of her doorway victims. She later told him what she did, and he doesn't mind at all. In fact, he proudly recounts the tale to his friends. How to Never Look Lost and Lonely at a Gathering At one time or another, most people have one of the top five reoccurring nightmares. Falling in space, failing a test, running and getting nowhere, being menaced by a monster, and getting caught naked in public. But practically everyone has this day-mare. You attend a gathering where guests are laughing, drinking, and making merry. All the while you are standing alone, looking forlorn and lonely. You fear that everyone thinks you are stupid, desperate, fraught with anxiety, and craving human contact. You may remember my friend Sammy from my audiobook, How to Talk to Anyone. He introduced me to a bizarre technique that has the power to rescue you from the lonely among the crowd syndrome. An organization I had spoken for invited me to an anniversary party and said I could bring a friend. Now, Sammy isn't exactly my type. He's a little rough around the edges, but he's got street smarts, and he's a lot of fun. Besides, I hadn't seen him in a while. When I invited him, I warned him he probably wouldn't know anyone there. Sammy didn't mind. He said, Lil, the combination of you, free grub, and a couple of beers is irresistible. I think he meant it as a compliment. The party was in full swing when he arrived. I spotted Sammy at the doorway and signaled him over. As he leisurely wound his way through the crowd, he waved at a few people across the room and gave them a big grin. By the time he got to me, I was dumbfounded. I said, Sammy, I had no idea you knew so many people here. Eh, I don't, he shrugged. But, oh, the waving bit, I've been using that old trick for years. You mean you're waving at strangers as if you know them? Don't they think you're batty? Ah, he said, all that waving and smiling makes me feel as confident as a peacock. Besides, I'm not waving to real people. I'm waving to empty spaces between them. Nobody can tell. They think it's somebody standing behind them or next to them. If I see somebody I like, though, sometimes I'll wave at the real person. Come on, Sammy, they'll think you're nuts. Nah, they won't. They think it's their fault and they should know me. Either that or they assume they're the only one I made a mistake on, and I really do know all those other people. The whole scheme sounded outrageous to me, until I saw how well it worked. A couple of people he'd waved to gravitated like sheep to Sammy the Shepherd. So did some social climbers who had seen Mr. Popularity entering. These determined folks just had to know anybody who knew everybody, and Sammy sure looked like he did. Little trick number 23. Wave to imaginary friends. When you face a daunting swarm of strangers, 
Don't stop at the door with that terrified, oh no, I don't know anyone here expression, and then slip in with the speed of a handicapped snail. Glide right in and gleefully wave either between bodies at imaginary people or at a real person across the room. It gets you into the crowd looking popular and confident, and it makes you feel popular and confident. Additionally, when you go up to people, they will be pleased that such a popular party goer has chosen to speak to them. How to ask great conversation starter questions. Getting a good conversation going with strangers at a party can be like starting a car in below freezing temperatures. It takes a couple of attempts before it's really up and running. If you've ever found yourself in a situation where no subject seems to turn the engine over, try the next few tips. When you are speaking with a couple, whether they are on their first date or married fifty years, a guaranteed heart warmer is this: How did you two first meet? After giggles or gales of laughter, you will see the joy in their eyes as they recount their first rendezvous. Some of the stories you'll hear are surprisingly R-rated. It is delightful to hear the over sixty set confess to their shameful, by the standards of their day, first encounters. The second query is quite simple. The perfect time to pose this question is soon after you have learned your new acquaintance's line of work. Simply ask, "What is your typical day like?" It throws the ball in his court, so you can just sit back and listen. Ask your friends this question too; they'll be delighted you care. Two other surefire conversation igniters are: How did you decide you wanted to become a whatever their job is, and why did you choose the name of the city to live in? How and why questions are great words to kickstart a conversation and get it humming. Little trick number twenty-four: Ask never fail fun conversation starters. Stop for a second. Think back to how you and your significant other met. Wouldn't you enjoy telling the tale? Likewise, wouldn't you be pleased that someone cared enough about your typical day to ask? Use these conversation starters with new acquaintances. If you need more material, throw in a few how and why questions about their life. I still regret that I missed my big chance to ask that electroplater, phrenologist, and <clears throat> erection coordinator. What is your average day like? How to get away from non-stop talkers? Have you ever known people whose idea of a conversation is a filibuster? You fantasize them suddenly coming down with a case of lockjaw, but no such luck. Say you're at a gathering and one of these non-stop talkers decides to hold you hostage. There are other people you want or should talk to, but escape seems hopeless. Your left and right brain have a conference to decide how to handle it. Your right brain says, "I could pretend I have to make a phone call." Left brain says, "No, he'll never fall for that hackneyed old song and dance." Right brain, "I know. I'll say I have to go talk to a friend." Left brain, "You've got to be kidding. He'll see through it in a heartbeat." Right brain, "Okay, so I'll say I need to go get another drink." Left brain. Ah,、uh、ah, -uh, dummy! Your glass is already full. Right brain. Well, I'll gulp it down and say I have to get another. Left brain. Then you'll look like old guzzle guts. Besides, you'll get wasted. Think harder. Well, here is how to get rid of those hardcore bores. Extreme talkers call for extreme measures. If it's a fairly crowded room, count on imaginary friends to get you out of this stressful situation. While time hogger is talking your ear off, wave to an imaginary person over his shoulder, then turn back to Big Mouth and say, "Excuse me, you were saying." Let him drone on for another twenty seconds, then peek over his shoulder again. This time, pretend you are annoyed by your pushy friend who is signaling you from behind his back. The third time you look over time hogger's shoulder, say. Excuse me. A friend is saying he must tell me something right now. I'll catch up with you later. If appropriate, a friendly touch on the arm substantiates your sincerity, and then disappear into the crowd. It sounds far-fetched, but I promise you that it works. 
I have never had a big mouth turn around to see precisely who is signaling me. If your conscience doesn't let you pull off that ploy, here is a more honest approach. Actually, it's my all-time favorite way to tackle this situation. Suppose you really were talking to a good friend, but you knew you must meet other people at the gathering. You'd probably say, hey, girlfriend or guy friend, I love talking to you, but we really should meet some other people now. To escape a bore, give her the formal version of this. Tell her, I really am enjoying talking to you, but we should probably mingle now. She may be just as happy as you to do that. Or, if you really want to lay it on thick, say, I should let you go now. I know there are other people who would like to talk to you. We can catch up later. Fat chance. Little Trick 25. Pretend someone is signaling you over their shoulder. Whether your party goal is finding new business, love, friendship, or just some fun, do not let anyone monopolize your time. Either escape with the help of an imaginary friend, or be, well, almost honest and tell him that you both should mingle. You and a lot of other interesting people have put too much effort into going to the event to get hijacked by an extreme talker. Part 4. Six Little Tricks to Be a Cool Communicator how to turn someone down while retaining his or her affection. Say someone calls to invite you to a, a business event, a barbecue, a beer bust, a two-person get-together, or any situation that you would rather eat worms than attend. If you don't want to offend the asker, employ the following little trick to allay his suspicion about your lack of enthusiasm. When he first asks you, do not give excuses and refuse. Predict his emotions in this situation. What will happen if you turn him down immediately? In addition to his regret that you cannot come, he will fear that you are rejecting him personally. Your refusal gives his self-esteem a flogging. So here's the plan. Accept the invitation gleefully. Turn your enthusiasm dial to high. If it's a party, ask directions to the fabulous affair. Ask if there's anything you can bring. Ask the dress code. If it's just the two of you getting together, ask about the restaurant, the film, the whatever, with exuberance. Stretch it out as long as he's loving it. Whether you realize it or not, you have now given the inviter an important part of the pleasure of your company. You make him feel acknowledged, accepted, and approved of. Additionally, you bestow upon him the bliss of babbling about the upcoming event. Now, at this point you have two choices. Number one, say, oh, let me put that right down in my calendar. Make the sound of ruffled papers. Then return to the phone crestfallen. Oh, no, that's the date I have to. You fill in the blank. I am so disappointed. He will be, too, but not nearly as much as if you turned him down immediately. Choice number two, accept with pleasure. Then wait an appropriate length of time before calling again. On this call, tell him that you didn't see something or other on your schedule, and sadly you can't make it. Do not feel guilty. You have rescued him from paranoia as well as given him a valued gift, your apparent esteem. Little trick number 26. Sound excited about it, and then give your regrets later. When a not-so-liked person extends an invitation to a not-so-liked event, accept it with enthusiasm. Get her bubbling about the date. Only later do you, quote, discover, regretfully, that you can't make it. Manipulation? Yes, for a very good cause. Preserving someone's self-esteem a quality everyone needs and deserves. Savvy singles, you have already probably realized how to use this little trick in dating. Ladies, the previous little trick is especially important if you want him to ask you out again. Let's say a man you sincerely do want to see again asks you out for a particular evening, but you really are busy that night. Do not turn him down right away. Never underestimate the fragility of the male ego when it comes to women. Once burned, 
he may never ask you again. Accept his invitation eagerly. Now he knows that you do want to go out with him. Shortly after, be devastated to discover that you had something on your schedule. Bat your eyelashes, as you suggest, but some other time? How to make people like you? By talking behind their backs. For a few years, I was a flight attendant. A Swedish girl named Tova Svensson was the most popular flight attendant I flew with, and we shared many experiences over the years. She and I went to refresher trainings at the airport together. We ran into flight crews around the terminal together, and occasionally we double-dated on layovers. The one thing that puzzled me about this poised Swedish lady was that occasionally she would speak a few sentences in a much louder voice. Then her volume would go back down to normal. It seemed strange, so I decided to monitor it. The next time she said something rather loudly, we were leaving a training class at the hangar. As we went through the door, she said, Yeah, that instructor is really good. I got a lot out of the class. At that high volume, of course, the instructor overheard it. Tova strikes again now with her full volume comment number two. Walking away from a colleague we had just talked to in the terminal, she said, She is really nice. Have you ever flown with her? The other flight attendant couldn't help but overhear it. Hmm, I wondered. Did she speak that high volume on purpose? My suspicions were proven the following week when we went to a party on a layover. On the way out, the host waved goodbye to us from his doorstep. Ten yards away, Tova said loudly, Yeah, that was really a fun party. Naturally, the party giver overheard it. Very clever little trick, Tova. She made it a point to compliment the teacher, the flight attendant, and the party giver, supposedly to me, but slightly louder so the person being complimented could hear it. Now I know one reason that she was so popular. Little trick number 27. Let people overhear your compliment. The only thing nicer than hearing a compliment is overhearing it. Your parents probably told you, don't talk about people behind their backs. Let us change that to, do talk about people behind their back, if you're saying nice things about them. Just be sure to say it loud enough for them to hear it. Have you ever had a great conversation with someone, but you don't remember what she said? In fact, you don't even remember what you were discussing, or even what you said. You just know you felt relaxed whenever you were speaking with her. It just might have something to do with the next little trick. How to make everyone comfortable speaking with you. While I was riding my bicycle one Sunday morning, a German shepherd decided to amuse itself by chasing me. Peeling away at full speed, I frantically looked back to see how close he was. I won the race, but wound up in a hospital bed with a twisted neck. That evening, a man I was seeing and a friend of his came over to visit me. Scott sat right by my side, and his buddy sat at the foot of the bed. I couldn't turn my head to look at Scott directly, but my peripheral vision told me that Scott looked uncharacteristically annoyed. I figured it was just sympathy for me and dismissed it. Cut to the following Saturday. We were having dinner at a restaurant, and the server delivered her entire dramatic monologue about the specials to Scott, Afterward, I groused, Well, she could have looked my way just once. Come on, Leal, he said accusatorily. You didn't look at me once when you were in the hospital. But you sure couldn't take your eyes off my friend. I couldn't look at you, Scotty, I said. You were sitting right beside me. You were a pain in the neck. I'm sorry, a physical pain in the neck, I mean, to talk to. But your friend was in my direct line of vision. Scott, you should have put your chair where I could see you without twisting my neck. This experience made me exquisitely aware of something we seldom consider. A comfortable conversation involves more than just your words and body language. It includes where you and your conversational partners are sitting and how comfortable they are. When entertaining, most people would ensure that a guest chair isn't too hard or that bright sunlight from a window isn't blinding them. But that is often where it stops. To fully enjoy conversation with you, people must experience no physical discomfort or any stress caused by your relative positions. 
For example, if you want a friendly exchange in the office, don't ask someone to sit on the other side of the desk from you. That can be intimidating. Put a chair by the side of your desk instead. If the two of you will be talking in a conference room, let the other person enter first and choose the chair. If you are one person in a couple conversing with someone, don't sit so far apart that the listener has to swivel her head back and forth like watching a tennis game. Even if you are sitting on a couch with someone side by side, slide your bottom an appropriate distance away so he can turn to look at you without straining his neck. This is especially important if you are chatting with someone in a wheelchair. Do not stand where she will get a sore neck looking up at you. Sit on her level or stand far enough away so that you are comfortably in her line of sight. Be especially compassionate when conversing with elderly people. Every decade, rotating their heads becomes more difficult for them. Also, they probably don't want to sit on a low couch where getting up is a struggle. When chatting with a seventy-plus set, offer them a higher chair with a straight back, and in a place where they can see your lips in case they are hard of hearing. Think of your relative seating positions, like feng shui, the ancient Chinese art of arranging furniture and other elements, to eliminate discordance. Choose your seat and theirs to obtain optimum comfort for all. After all, if the Chinese do it for their dead, you can do it for your living friends. Little trick number twenty-eight: Assure your conversation partner's physical comfort. When you enter someone's home or office, don't just plop down anywhere. Pick your perch with care. When entertaining. Offer seats to people, keeping in mind your guests' ages, abilities, status, and their sex. Relative positioning affects the encounter much more than you can imagine. Now, when it comes to talking with males, there is more to consider. Sisters, when I was growing up, psychologists, psychiatrists, and feminists tried to convince us that men and women were alike. In the big nature versus nurture turmoil, the majority cast their votes on the nurture side. But in this so-called century of enlightenment, neurosurgeons have ascertained otherwise. Their finely tuned instruments point to precise clumps of neurons that, while not exactly pink or blue, do indicate gender proclivities. One of those proclivities for a male is that sitting where he can't see the door is disquieting for him at the least. Devastating at the most. Perhaps it comes from watching too many cowboy movies. If the gunslinging dude wearing the white hat didn't face the saloon door, the bad guy in the black hat could blast him in the back. Mafia members who weren't facing restaurant doors learned that the hard way. Whatever the origin, sharp people today are savvy about the gender sitting game, and they play it skillfully. Ladies, let's say you walk into a restaurant and have to choose a table. Be sure to leave the best seat for him. Now, the best seat, in the male estimation, is not the one with the nicest view, nor the warmest in the winter or the coolest in the summer. If you want a happy puppy at your table, give him the one facing the door. Little trick twenty-nine: Let the dude face the door. They haven't isolated the specific gene that makes men jumpy sitting with their backs to the door, but trust the inexplicable, indisputable truth. Sisters, upon entering the restaurant, the meeting, the whatever, go for the seat that puts your back to the door. Our neurons can take it; theirs can't. Wait, it gets more complicated. While the following tips are generalizations, of course, put your tongue in your cheek and keep your eyes open to see who wants whom to sit where. Ladies, would you believe that where a man invites you to sit can reveal how he feels about you? And gentlemen, did you know that the chair she instinctively chooses indicates her sentiments about you? You probably know that sitting across from one another creates a distance. But ladies, did you know that sitting or being invited to sit on his left signifies, let's just be friends and nothing more. But sitting on his right hints the opposite. Why? Because a man always wants his woman on the right. I know. I don't get it either. It's a guy thing. 
Now, gentlemen, between you it gets competitive. Fellows, the facing the door dilemma is trickier for you because to make your male colleague, friend, or boss more relaxed, you must turn your testosterone meter down and overcome your discomfort sitting with your back to the door. We women will never understand it. When it's purely social, girlfriends seldom care where they sit, unless there is a desirable male in the room. How to escape bores that you run into without hurting their feelings. See if the following scene is familiar to you. It's ten o'clock on a glorious Saturday morning, cool and crisp, seventy degrees, zero humidity, and a cloudless robin's egg blue sky. An occasional gust of wind rustles the leaves, tingles your skin, but within seconds the warm sun's rays bake it away. As you stroll along the street, you're humming you twos. It's a beautiful day. Don't let it get away. Then blam, you spot a nascent disaster. That bore who always talks your ear off. He can compress the most words into the smallest idea of any man you know. He is the last person on earth you would want to squander one second of this heavenly day on. But alas, he has spotted you. It's too late. Hey, how you doing? He waves. Pretty good. Nice to see you. You speed say as you pick up your pace and pass him. Where'd you go on vacation? He calls back. Darn it. Now you must turn back and chat with him for a bit. At this point, most people's bodies belie their mock friendly words. Like a horse backing away from a cruel handler, they prance backward. Their bucking is obvious and their snorts almost audible. Then they gallop off, leaving their acquaintance feeling like trodden hay. Do not do that to people. Don't ruthlessly perform the rude breakaway dance. Just because you're still facing them, you think they don't notice you're backing away? It is as obvious as you're thumbing your nose at them. Instead, use the following little trick, which speeds you toward salvation and your destination. It also makes the boar admire you. Sound impossible? Here's the plan. When you spot the windbag who wants to snare you into conversation, pick up your speed so he will see you walking briskly as though you are late somewhere. But when you are almost within speaking distance to your quote friend, feign happy surprise and come to a screeching halt. Greet him enthusiastically. Do not look rushed. Do not step back. Do not start prancing in place. Train your face to say, "I'm really looking forward to yakking it up with you." Confirm this with a, "I've got all the time in the world for you." Demeanor. Then do yak it up. For forty-five seconds, that is the minimum amount of time to qualify it as a bona fide conversation. Look laid back and go nice and slow during your convivial chat. Then and only then, look at your watch. Appear disappointed and explain regretfully that you are late for a meeting, a date, an appointment, a funeral, whatever. Now, here is the most important part: walk away. At a leisurely pace, but when you get about ten feet from him, break into a canter, race away as though you were making up for the time you lost because you really preferred to stay with him and chat. He's thinking to himself, "What a guy! He was really rushed, but he wanted to talk to me so much that he risked being late." Now this screeching to a halt, micro chatting, then racing away like hell, little trick is also effective in the corporate halls of our great work-obsessed country. Not only does it get you away from the office bore you encounter in the hall, it makes you look like you are rushing to get your work done too. Little trick thirty: walk away slowly, then let them see you sprint. A quick recap on how to escape a bore in five easy steps. One, wave enthusiastically when you first spot her. Two, stop and chat, unrushed, for forty-five seconds. Three, look at your watch and appear devastated. Four, walk away slowly. Five, after a few yards, break into a sprint and run like hell. Now she feels valued. You retain her respect. 
and it didn't take any longer than that insulting white rabbit breakdance. How to read people's minds. About six months ago, I was insecure about a chapter I had written for this audiobook, so I asked a good friend, Anne Torrego, to read it. Anne is a warm-hearted person, so even if a chapter made her gag, she would never tell me. I gave her the manuscript and strategically sat in another chair across the room. While I pretended to read the newspaper, I was furtively peering over the paper at Anne's face. Her deadpan expression confirmed my suspicion. In spite of her later compliments, I knew my chapter was the pits. A few weeks later, I was telling the Anne story to the son of a friend of mine. Jonathan Rahm is a trainer and talented horse whisperer in Sullivan County, New York. Now, a horse whisperer reads horses' feelings by watching their ear positions, tail movements, their respiratory rate, their nostrils, and other signals that riders with shattered kneecaps obviously missed. When I finished, he said, "Yeah, it's easier to read a person than a horse." I said, "You've got to be kidding, Jonathan. People can fake their emotions. Horses can't." He responded, "Sure, Leo. People can fake it when they think they're being watched." But watch them when they think they aren't. When they're off guard, that's when you get the real story. I like to think of it as being a people whisperer. This insight by a twenty-six-year-old stunned me with the obvious truth: lips can lie while speaking, but lips tell the truth when they think no one is looking. I researched the subject and discovered that science is now paying some pretty serious attention. To those fleeting, split-second expressions that slip across our faces thousands of times each day, Daniel McNeil, author of *The Face: A Natural History*, wrote: "In the last twenty years, we've learned more about the communicative power of the face than in the previous twenty millennia. By connecting facial expression to brain activity with extraordinary precision, researchers are discovering that, in a sense," It is possible to read someone's mind, and when you learn how to do it too, you become an exquisitely better communicator. Just imagine how much more persuasive and sensitive you'll be when you know what people are thinking. Let's say you are at an office meeting and your team leader proposes a change in direction for the current project, but you don't agree. Glance at your colleagues' faces. Do they have a microscopic hint of a frown? Or are their lips and eyes softer? If the latter, you know that you would be the lone voice against the change. Therefore, even if you do speak up, you won't be successful. When watching a DVD with a friend, momentarily take your eyes off the screen and sneak a peek at his face. No mystery there. You can easily determine if your friend is enjoying the film or not. You can track everyone's emotions. Pretty accurately from his or her subtle, supposedly unseen expressions. Here's an example of how subtle. The next sunny weekend that you are at the beach, watch the sunbathers on sandy towels soaking up the rays. They're not smiling, but if you focus on their mouths, you'll see an ever so slight lifting at the corners. Then, while driving to work on Monday morning, glance at other drivers in a traffic jam. Lifted lips are as rare as a solar eclipse. The difference in facial expressions is more obvious when you have access to both at the same time. At an airport, gaze first at the faces of people waiting for their loved ones to come out the exit. Now, compare them with the expressions of limousine drivers holding a sign with their unknown passenger's name on it. The first expression is not a smile. It is just a minuscule lifting of the muscles on either side of the mouth. The second expression is not a frown. The limousine drivers simply have a deadpan expression. There are many social benefits to developing this sensitivity. Gentlemen, wouldn't it be nice to know whether your date, who says she likes baseball, is really enjoying the game? If she is straight-faced, don't invite her to another one, or you might get turned down, and then you'd wonder why. Ladies, watch your husband's face while he's driving to dinner at the in-laws. Now you'll get the real story on how he feels about it.
Kids are naturals at face reading. Did you ever see a kid take his eyes off mom's expression when she's reading his report card? Incidentally, this little trick has already benefited you. Why? If it hadn't been for Anne's bored expression, you too would be subjected to listening to that tedious chapter that I deleted due to her deadpan expression. Little trick thirty-one: read their lips when they are not speaking. Like a pilot scanning the horizon for other planes, make it a habit to scan the faces in any group. Pay special attention to the corners of their lips. When you are able to read their minds, your emotional prediction meter shoots straight up. Therefore, your skill in communicating will almost double. No exaggeration. People are who they are when they think no one is looking. Part five: Six little tricks to give your email today's personality and tomorrow's professionalism. How to make people smile when they see that the email is from you? You have probably heard the story of Ivan Petrovich Pavlov's pooches salivating at the sound of a bell. You may not, however, heard of his other slobbering dogs with the chili powder. I find that experiment more memorable, and you might too. So let's go with that canine study. Pavlov originally served his canine subjects gourmet meals coated with chili powder. After a while, he denied them their epicurean delights and just sprinkled some chili powder around. Yet for a long time, his dogs continued to drool at the smell of chili powder. It's called being conditioned. Now you needn't condition your email recipients to drool when they see an email messages from you, but nor do you want them to shudder. A few years ago, I took care of my two young nieces for the week while their parents took a long-awaited, much-deserved vacation. I had to leave for an overnight trip, but a reliable friend, Fiona, offered to stay with them at my place. The next morning at the hotel, just before my speech, I received an email from Fiona. The subject line was "accident." My fingers shook so violently I had trouble opening the message. It read. Oh, Lil, I feel so awful. I knocked over that beautiful green vase you have in the living room, and it shattered. I tried to glue it together again, but it will never be the same. Nor would my feelings for Fiona, not consciously that is, and not because of the vase, but because of the jolt she'd given me. She obviously didn't predict my emotion, the terror I would feel after reading her subject line, fearing that something terrible had happened to my nieces. Now every time I see Fiona's name in the from field, I involuntarily shudder. She inadvertently conditioned me to feel fear, just seeing that the message is from her. Didn't she realize that I'd freak out just reading the word accident when my precious little nieces Allison and Julia were in her care? Think about it. How would you feel getting an email from your boss with the following subject line? Meet me in my office at nine tomorrow morning. Even if in the body of the message your boss had written he wanted to give you a raise, the momentary jolt would have already done its damage. No matter what good tidings your messages bear, predict the emotions that recipients will feel reading your subject line. Those fleeting pricks of pain that you gave them are very hard to erase. Little trick thirty-two. Avoid scary subject lines. Be careful that your subject line couldn't be misunderstood, and then inadvertently foreshadow something negative. No matter what pleasantries follow in your message, it's too late. Your recipient has subconsciously anchored you to unpleasantness. Forever after, just seeing your name in the from field reinvokes that painful jolt. The opposite is true too. If your boss's subject line had read "You got a raise," that would translate into warm feelings for him or her. Always anchor yourself to pleasure by writing upbeat subject lines. For example, if someone has given you a gift, write "fabulous gift" as the subject. If you are writing someone to say how much you enjoyed her party, write "great party" as the subject. Why make your recipients wait until they get into the message to smile?
When I sent the manuscript of this audiobook to my editor, her first message back was, Love it! Unfortunately, it turns out she had only read the table of contents. But her subject line thrilled me so much that I kept it going on our messages for months, even when she was scolding me about a part she didn't like. You may ask, what if the subject thread is already established? If the same old subject line has been going back and forth, leave it as it is. When appropriate, though, add an upbeat comment after it in parentheses. Let's say your team at the office has been working on a project for the patent company, and the email thread has been the patent project. Now it is successfully over. Keep the original subject and then add the make them smile part. Write, Ray, the patent project, parentheses, Great job, everybody. Do you ever watch reruns of the classic sitcom Seinfeld? Kramer's scenes are so funny that audiences laugh the second he skids in the door, before he even says a word. Do the same thing with your subject lines. Check your sent mailbox as soon as you get back to your computer. Scan your old subject lines. How many of them would make your recipient smile before opening the message? Little trick number 33. Write, make them smile, subject lines. Starting today, write only upbeat subject lines. If the subject is already established, season it occasionally with something pleasant in parentheses. After you have sent a few of these make them smile subject lines, you have conditioned people to have a warm response just seeing that the message is from you. I've often heard people say that email is impersonal and that you can't tell much about someone just from their written words. I beg to differ. Naturally, your message doesn't reveal as much as your voice or your body language, but your words are like a lighthouse signaling everyone about your self-image. So this next section tells you how to avoid sounding egotistical in your email. People who reside in mental institutions use the word I 12 times more than non-residents. Ergo, it figures that the fewer times you use the word I, the saner you sound. In conversation, it is certainly a good idea to avoid saying I too many times. Once uttered, though, it becomes just another sound wave blown away by the breezes. In email, however, that big black I stays plastered on your recipient's screen. Some people start so many sentences with the word I that their message looks like it has a left-hand border. Wait a minute, Leah, you're thinking. Everybody talks about themselves, their thoughts, actions, feelings, suggestions. That's what messages are all about. I say you're right. In fact, here is a typical casual message to a friend. Hi, Rick. I really had a good time at your party last night at the club, and I met lots of interesting people. I hope you and your wife can join us next week for dinner. I think you will enjoy Sasha's cooking. Do you notice how an I starts each sentence? They're repetitive, not to mention self-focused, even though the writer is supposedly reaching out to his friend. See how much better this sounds. And the only thing different is that you deleted the I's. Hi, Rick. Really had a good time at your party last night at the club and met lots of interesting people. Hope you and your wife can join us next week for dinner. Think you'll enjoy Sasha's cooking. Did you hear that there isn't one I in the entire message? So what's an emailer to do? If your dearly deceased third-grade grammar teacher heard the following advice, she would turn over in her grave. If she's still alive, it would drive her to it. But it's simple to do and it sounds way less egotistical. Little trick number 34. Delete most of the I's in your messages. Tweet your informal emails and wipe out the word I as many times as you can. You will sound less self-centered and therefore more likable. To prove it, open any email message you have recently written. Delete practically every I and the message will probably stand on its own. Everybody will like it better, except grammarians. In spots where it sounds strange to drop the I, simply put your recipient's name before it. Example, write, Rick, I really hope you and your wife can join us. If you'd like to take it a step further, switch the words around 
and start as many sentences as you can with the word you. Hi, Rick. You really gave a great party last night at the club, and everyone enjoyed it. You invited lots of interesting people. You and your wife can join us for dinner next week, right? You'll enjoy Sasha's cooking. It works in business email too. Substituting you for I makes business communications friendlier. See which you like better. Dear Mr. Jones, we received your order for two gizmos yesterday. I will email you as soon as they come in, and we will send them out the day after. That's average, the way people usually write messages. Here's the little trick thirty-four way to write it. It makes the customer feel important. Dear Mr. Jones, your order for two gizmos arrived yesterday. You will be notified by email as soon as they come in, and you will receive them the day after. If your messages that make them feel important pile up, you've got yourself a loyal customer. How to sound like you have a crystal ball in your email messages? Before every flight, airline pilots do a pre-takeoff check of how much fuel is in the tank and whether the wing flaps move freely. Likewise, before your email messages take off in the cyberspace, perform a relationship check. Practically all civilized folk make a gratuitous, almost obligatory reference to the recipient in their opening sentence, such as "I hope you had a good weekend," or they extend their good wishes for holidays past, present, or future. That is as original as a white wall. But thanks to the wonders of the World Wide Web, you can now make your messages more relevant. Let's say you are writing to someone in a different state. Check the local weather report. Did she just have a big snowstorm? Right. Hi, Brenda. How are you surviving the blizzard? A wildfire? Natalie, I do hope that horrible blaze didn't get anywhere near your neighborhood. A heat wave? Hey, girl. Did you melt yet? The recipients will never guess that Weather. dot com did the work for you. Keep it on your favorites list. Before writing, also see if there's any big news in their burg. Tack a world map on your wall. Now throw a dart at it. Wherever it lands, no matter how tiny the town, something has happened there. You have never seen a banner headline, even on the One Horse Herald, saying "Nothing happened here today." Is a celebrity visiting their boonies? Did the hometown boy genius win third place in the state spelling bee? What about the grand opening of the new museum of twentieth-century beer bottle caps? Your reader will never suspect the obvious, that your web search gave you the skinny. You've only spent a few seconds to score big with them. You can actually narrow it down even further, and the recipient doesn't have to be from out of town to use this little trick. Your search engine can surreptitiously swoop down on every neighborhood and dig up any dirt that any freaked-out blogger has written about their hood. I once received an email from an uptown colleague who wrote, "I hope no falling bricks hit you." He was referring to a freshly fallen building in my Lower Manhattan neighborhood. This is a common and unnoteworthy event in the Big Bagel, unless it's yours or your neighbor's building. His knowledge and concern impressed me. Little trick number thirty-five: Do a news and weather check before clicking send. Take just a few seconds to enhance or create a relationship with your recipient. Send your search engine into cyberspace like a Saint Bernard, and before you blink, it will be back with something better than a barrel of brandy to boost your connection. It's a small investment for a big reward. Suppose you don't find any news from their corner of the world. All is not lost. Run a search through their messages that they sent you months ago, then write opening lines like, "Zach, you never told me about your drive to Disneyland last year. Did the kids enjoy it?" Or, "Nora, how's that new little niece of yours doing? Get to spend much time with her?" Or, "Kaylee, did you ever discover the identity of your mystery admirer who sent you the rock candy? What did the dentist say?" Little trick number thirty-six. Put memories in your messages. Take a diving expedition into previous messages from your intended recipient. Surface 
with some forgettable, to everybody but them, fact about their life, and then refer to it. They're thinking, wow, I must really be important to her. Look how she remembers the details of my life. Still didn't find anything? Don't give up. The personal touch can make all the difference in a message. Excavate any other element you can refer to. Check the time he sent the message. Refer to it. Did he send you a business communication at 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. from the office? End your message with, Go home, Christopher. You're working too hard. She sent it to you at the wee hours. Jokingly chastise her. You're burning the midnight oil again, Madison. Go get some beauty sleep. Although don't imply that she needs it, of course. How to sign your messages in the new millennium. Email's official birthday is October 1971. Can you believe, these many years after the dawning of this universal technology, that we are still struggling with how to sign our messages? Should we write, Regards, Sincerely, Best, Thanks, Our Name, Initials, Nothing? Babies born pre-Windows are totally bewildered. Those weaned on floppy disks are just as baffled. When Generation Nexters ask their grandmothers, Granny, what are letters? She will explain that they were email messages that were handwritten or keyboarded on paper. When she tells her grandchildren that every one of them had to be signed with sincerely yours, cordially yours, respectfully yours, and the like, they will stare at her in disbelief. It finally dawned upon email writers that using those valedictions mimicked archaic typewritten letters too much. Many shortened it to just one word, sincerely or cordially. But now we're even struggling to do away with that in more casual communicating. Some people ask, well, what about just signing your name? The majority answers, that sounds callous. So what to do? Let's consult the shrink from cyberspace. For the answer to the burning question, how shall we sign our emails, Earthlings must summon the great IT man in the sky to our planet. He is the cyber psychiatrist who can answer perplexing psychological and ethical questions that come with the new technology. The crowd stands, straining their necks to see Cyber Shrink's spaceship arrive. The moment he disembarks, there is a great crescendo of, How should we sign our email messages? Like all psychiatrists, he answers their question with a question. Why must you have a closing to your message? Well, to pay deference to the receiver, someone shouts out. It's so that our messages have a friendlier ending, calls out another. Yes, Cyber Shrink nods. He then points his finger in the air. What is the sweetest sound in the English language to someone? Their name, the group asks. He strokes his goatee and adds... Yes, and that, my dear earthlings, is how you should sign your email. A few of the more confident in the crowd cry out, Well, what do their names have to do with my signature? Cybershrink again responds with a question. The whole point of your signature phrase is to show respect and close your message in a friendly way, right? The throng nods in unison. So simply end your message with a warm sentence that includes their name. It is even better if you can make their name the very last word in the body of the message. That gives them what I believe you humans call the fuzzies and the warms. Then your name isn't necessary. In all but the most formal messages, he adds, you can put your initials to signal that that is the end. Alternatively, if you are especially attached to your first name, I condone that as well. The grateful assembly gasps, Yes, yes, thank you! The wise guru then climbs back aboard his spaceship. The crowd looks up to the sky and waves as Cybershrink vanishes back into the universe where all our email gets lost. Little trick number 37. Sign your messages with their name. Both your personal and professional email messages sound warmer when you work the recipient's name into the last sentence. They know who it's from anyway. Reading the sweetest sound in the English language to them as the closing of your message creates a subliminal sense of respect and friendliness. Here are some examples. Thanks so much for your help, Elisa. I'm looking forward to talking with you, Alfred.
Lauren, it was great having dinner with you. Good going, Emma. You really impressed the client. It was great meeting you, John. Your initials, first name, or even nothing after such sentences suffice. Hearing their own name unexpectedly as the last word of your message makes them feel an instant connection with you. Part 6. Four Little Tricks to Make a Big Impression on Your Cell, a.k.a. Phone. How to Know When to Email, When to Phone. Marshall McLuhan, the great Canadian educator, philosopher, scholar, and communications theorist, wrote, The form of a message embeds itself in the message, creating a symbiotic relationship by which the medium influences how the message is perceived. Well, happily, somebody shortened that to, the medium is the message. Mr. McLuhan never heard of email, but he would have said the same thing if he had. He also would have predicted the problem that most of us still struggle with. Should I phone him or email him? Shall I email her or phone her? In short, when is it more appropriate to phone... And when is it more appropriate to email? Some things are better said, others are better read. Sometimes, of course, it's obvious. But what about when it's not? Let's say you are staying at a friend's house while she is working on an important project out of town. You are watering the plants, walking the dog, and feeding her ten goldfish. Sadly, one of them goes belly up. Oh, dear, should I email her, you think? No, that's a little crass. Should I call her at the office? No, she's busy and might think I'm stupid to call her to the phone for one dumb little goldfish. After all, she does have nine others. On the other hand, she might love those little ectotherms. And when she gets back, she'll be devastated. She'll scream at me, Why didn't you tell me that Parnell passed away? Shall I email or phone? Email or phone? Email or phone? Don't lose any sleep over it. There's a middle road. Figure out a time when you know the person is not going to be at the number you're calling and leave a recorded message for him. Late at night is great for leaving a voicemail message at the office. Choose midday to leave a message at his home. Be sure, though, to start the message with something like, I know you're busy and I didn't want to drag you to the phone. That's why I'm calling you while you're out of the office. If it's true, you can add, There's no need to call me back. That demonstrates extreme respect for his time. Friends and lovers, you can use the same little trick. If, for personal reasons, you don't want to actually speak to your colleague or crush, leave an off-hours message. You can convey precisely the sentiment you wish. Note, this is not recommended for breaking up with someone. Hearing smiles or frowns in your voice is more effective than reading smiley faces, which, as you know, professional types tell us not to use. Leaving a phone message is more personal and actually less time-consuming than writing an email. And if it's a delicate or legal matter... You are not leaving an email trail. Little trick number 38. Leave a phone message when you know that they're out. When you don't want to drag someone to the phone, but you still prefer the personal touch, leave a phone message when she is not there. Between the lines, she'll know that you are doing it out of respect for her busy schedule. Just in case, however, tell her, Harley, I'm calling after hours because I didn't want to pull you to the phone just for this, but... And then yada, yada, yada. How to boost their self-esteem with your cell phone. About a year ago, I received a call from a man I thought was a big cat, but he swiftly shrunk to a little puss. Marty was the marketing director of an early dot-com company. Most of the dot-coms became dot-bombs by the turn of the century, but as he told anyone who would listen, he, quote, single-handedly saved the company. Marty had invited me to lunch to discuss the possibility of my training their customer service reps in telephone skills. From his swagger into the restaurant, I sensed he was not the shy, sensitive type. As soon as we sat down, 
he confirmed it. Like a Wild West cowboy slamming his gun on the saloon counter, Marty whipped out his cell phone and whacked it on the table next to his dessert spoon. Before I could even pick up the menu, his hand and phone were again in an embrace. After a barely audible, excuse me, he eagerly listened to his messages. I pretended that the menu mesmerized me until it finally dawned upon him that he had a dining partner. After the waiter took our order, we began chatting. Suddenly, I heard an infant crying, but where was it coming from? I turned around. There were no babies in the restaurant. Marty looked at me with a hearty ha ha fool you grin as he picked up the howling phone he proudly announced, That's a recording of my kid crying. It drives the wife crazy. She's not the only one, I murmured to myself. I am so not going to work for you. Being imprisoned in Marty's cell phone hell just wouldn't be worth it. His digital infant howled three more times during our lunch. Each time he picked it up and looked lovingly into its little backlit face. He was calculating who was more important, the caller or me. As we left the restaurant, I fantasized him crawling around the house in nothing but diapers with his cell phone attached by a big safety pin. What about you? How many times have you been chatting amicably with someone and suddenly your sentence is cut short by the sound of chimes, Beethoven's Fifth, Led Zeppelin, or salsa music resonating from her pocket or purse? Like submitting to the spell of singing mermaids, she dives for her cell and stares transfixed at the screen for a second. Even if she deems you more important than the caller and then puts it back in its resting place, the damage is done. She had no sensitivity to your feelings, no emotional prediction. You probably think I am going to simply advise, turn off your cell phone before meeting with someone. Sure, that's a good idea, but just average. Here is how to openly demonstrate your deference for someone. One time on a blind date, a Czech architect spun my heart like a top. Ivan Batakuda was good-looking. But that was not the reason he was well-spoken. But that was not the reason he seemed kind. But that was not the reason. Curious? As soon as we sat down at the restaurant, without breaking eye contact or missing a word, Ivan reached into his pocket. I heard the power-down music of his cell under his voice. That sweet sound told me that at that moment I was more important than anyone who could possibly be calling him. Did I hear someone say, but that's manipulative. Why didn't he just turn off his cell phone before meeting you? My answer is this. Is it manipulative when American soldiers salute a general? Is it manipulative when the Brits stand for the Queen? Is it manipulative when Thai children kneel beside their elders on their New Year and wash their feet with lustful water? No, I say they are demonstrating deference. If the soldiers, citizens, or kids were saluting, standing, or spreading water all over the place ahead of time, the generals, queens, and elders could not relish the respect that they were expressing. And if you turn your cell phone off ahead of time, your friend or colleague won't be able to witness and relish your esteem. Little trick number 39. Let them hear you turn your cell phone off. Demonstrate your deference for someone by leaving your cell phone on until you sit down for the discussion, the dinner, or just precious time together. Then, at the very beginning of your rendezvous, reach for it. Without breaking eye contact, nonchalantly turn the potential interruption off. The lyrics of the Power Down music say to that person, For these moments... You have priority over anyone in the world. Oops, you ask? What if I forgot to do this and it rings while I'm with the person? Well, calmly proceed to the next maneuver. It is, however, for the agile only. Just like rolling your coin on your knuckles, the following move demands dexterity and practice. First, place your cell in its usual carrying position. Then rehearse, reaching for it without looking and pressing the off key. But silencing it is not enough. Let them hear that sweet power-down song afterward.
This little trick is especially impressive if you execute it while speaking and you don't miss a syllable. Practice it a dozen times; you'll get the hang of it. How to deal with a caller when you don't know who the heck it is? I'm sure it's happened to you. Your phone rings; you answer it. A cheery voice says, "Hi, this is Peter." Peter? Peter who? I don't know any Peters. Most people would ask precisely that. Ah,、oh, uh, Peter who? But because you have emotional prediction, you know Peter, whoever he is, would be devastated. A rude Peter might even respond, "You don't remember me, you know, from the golf course." Then Mr. or Mrs. Average would try to save the caller's face by saying unconvincingly, "Peter, oh, of course, I am so sorry." But it's too late. Poor Peter feels forgotten, and you feel flustered. Not an auspicious start to a pleasant dialogue. Let's do the numbers. Business researchers tell us we meet about a hundred people a year by name: social acquaintances, business contacts, and a few distant cousins who come out of the woodwork. And half of them will have the gall to think that you should actually remember their names. Another half of that half could possibly contact you, and for one reason or another, half of that half will. You are now down to twelve and one half people per year whose names you don't remember phoning you. Prepare yourself with the following face-saving yours and theirs rejoinder. It not only saves the intrusive caller's ego, it conceals your memory lapse. He says, "Hi, this is Peter." With a big smile, you say, "Hi, I know two Peters. Which one is this?" When he says you met at the golf club, sound like you are so pleased that it is this Peter, not that other one. If he just says his last name and pompously expects that to jog your memory, simply say from. If he's the decent sort, he'll fill in the rest of your sentence. If he doesn't, you probably don't want to speak to that rude dude anyway. Little trick number forty: tell who's it that you know two who's its. When someone gives only her first name on the phone and you don't know who the heck she is, say with as much congeniality as you can cough up, "Oh, I know too." Fill in her name. Which one is this? There is a good chance she will happily give you her last name or the context in which you met. How to get rid of those talk your ear off people on the phone? Suppose a ruthless, non-stop talker keeps blithering away on the phone, impervious to your entreaties that you need to go. If your conscience condones, execute the following little trick. There are three necessary tools: a sense of humor, one small purchase, and a touch of sadism. Go to a toy store and ask for one of those plastic kitty phones with an authentic-sounding ring. Then place it next to your real phone. I call it the kitty phone scam. Here's the tactic. Step one: While long-winded person is rambling on, press the ring button on the kitty phone. Let it ring three times. Step two: Say to the non-stop talker, "Excuse me one second, my other line is ringing." Then hold the receiver at arm's distance away. Step three: Stop the ringing on the kitty phone. Say to an imaginary, very important person, loud enough for the yapper to overhear, "No, no, hold on. I was just finishing up with this other call. I'll be right back." Step four: Return briefly to the windbag and tell him, "I'm so sorry. I've been waiting for this important call. It just came in." Unless he's out for blood, he'll say goodbye. Little trick forty-one: Buy a "I gotta go" toy phone. Keep a realistic-sounding kitty phone in reach of your real phone. If you make it ring and play your role, you can terminate your conversation with an agonizingly long talker in ten seconds or less. Oh, I forgot the final step. Give a fiendish sigh of relief after they hang up, and then kiss your kitty phone. Part seven: Five little tricks. To deepen the relationships you already have, how to win their hearts a year later. When a certain date rolls around on your calendar each year, 
Do you get that silly, faraway look on your face and indulge in happy reveries, remembering a magnificent event in your life? Was it when you graduated, got your first job, met your spouse, gave up smoking, adopted your beloved pet, or won the fifth grade hula hoop championship? How sweet it is when your mind soars back, your memories get big, and your pupils get small. The special day I remember is when my first book came out. The publisher promised to send me ten copies. I waited anxiously by the mailbox on the day that I knew they would arrive. When the postman came, I tore open the box and breathlessly showed him the table of contents. I tormented him, talking about each chapter. Perhaps quote, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night could stay the courier from the swift completion of his appointed rounds, but I sure could. When the patient public servant finally broke away from my babbling, I bet he was contemplating writing a book himself about the nut on his route. On the next girl's night out, I chortled about my new work uniform, my pajamas. Ha ha ha! I crowed about my new work commute from the bed to the computer. Ha ha ha! Why weren't they laughing? A few days later, I dismounted my high horse and became human again. Life went back to normal. Although I did notice the postman avoiding me, cut to precisely three hundred and sixty-five days. One year later, I ambled to my mailbox, but expecting nothing special. However, I found a fancy handwritten envelope. Inside was a congratulations card. For what? From whom? When I read it, I was overcome with a severe case of the warm and fuzzies. Several of my friends, who had suffered from my swelled head exactly one year previous to the date, wrote, "Happy anniversary on the publication of your first book." I had to hold back the tears. Of course, receiving a birthday or holiday card is lovely. However, it can't compare to the unexpected joy of receiving a note celebrating a happy personal event in your life. It's a law of human nature. The more original and more unexpected a tribute is, the more people will treasure it. If you currently recall, or if you can dredge up the precise date of something special in a friend's life last year, jot it down. Then commemorate it with a personal event anniversary card when that day rolls around this year. If your memory bank is currently empty, at least lay the groundwork for using little trick number forty-two next year. Start making note of happy events in your friends' and colleagues' lives. My good friend Vicky Abraham said she fell in love with her future husband in a hot tub on Labor Day weekend. The following year, I sent her a Happy Hot Tub Day card on September first. She says she will never forget it. Little trick number forty-two: send a personal event anniversary card. Try to remember some accomplishment or special event in your friends' lives. Maybe the day he got a promotion, or when your married friends met, or divorced, and of course, don't forget the date their little bundle of joy was born, or when the tot got her first tooth. The list goes on and on, and so does their appreciation of you when you send them a personal event anniversary card. Here's another reason I like this little trick. I once had a tough boss, a textbook bully, who was bonkers about her cat. If she wasn't picking on me or barking orders, she was boasting about Bootsy. I wanted to go deaf every time she gave me the details of his diet, his hairballs, his birthday, even his preferred kitty litter. Now that was the year I had started remembering special events in people's lives, so I sent Bootsy a birthday card. I don't think I'm imagining it, but after that, things got a lot easier for me around the office. How to make them always remember your thank you. When you were a toddler, your parents probably programmed you to say thank you when anyone gave you a present. They used to call it bringing you up right. Now they call it good parenting. When someone gives you a gift, of course you must say thank you. The words have become so common, though, that they sound like ambient noise. The bottom line is that the giver expects your thanks, and therefore it is nothing out of the ordinary. If you really want to thrill them with your gratitude, though, use the upcoming little trick. Here's how it was born. 
One year I gave my friend Selena an inexpensive little music box. She sent me a thank you note, which I appreciated and naturally expected. A few months later, I received an email from her saying, "Leal, I can't tell you how much pleasure your music box continues to give the whole family." Instead of grumbling and diving back under the covers when I shout, "Time to get up!" the kids beg me to wake them up to the sound of the beautiful music box. I wind it up and tiptoe into their room every morning. They wake up smiling, even before they've had their breakfast. Her message gave me more pleasure than the little music box could have ever given her. She made me feel like the goddess of giving. Thank you is more beautiful the second time around. Little trick number forty-three. Thank them again months later. Whenever you thank someone for a gift, make a note to ponder the pleasure the present still gives you months later. Then thank him a second time, detailing how much you continue to enjoy it and why. He will find this second little thank you much more precious than the big first one. And incidentally, he will add you to his list of extraordinary people. How to give them compliments they'll never forget. It feels good when your supervisor passing your desk says, "Hey, good job on finding that folder yesterday. Thanks." But picture this: she comes to your desk in the morning, stops, smiles, looks you in the eyes, uses your name, and tells you, "I am really impressed that you took it upon yourself to search for that missing folder yesterday." She continues. You could have given up when it wasn't in the right drawer, but you stayed late and went through all the file cabinets. You didn't give up until you found it. Good job! Thank you so much. Now that doesn't just feel good; it feels great. Your smile lasts all day. Driving home, you are still purring. You even tell your family about it at dinner. Suddenly, you like your boss a whole lot more. Of course, you'll go the extra mile for her again. No question about it. Or picture this: you do a favor for a friend by taking her loudmouth kid brother to the movies and Burger King afterward. As expected, he acts obnoxious the whole time. When you get back, your friend says, "Hey, thanks for taking my little funny face to the film for me." You lie. Sure, no problem. But you're secretly thinking that's the last time I take that little brat anywhere. However, when you bring him back, what if your friend smiled and said? Hey, thanks for taking Funny Face to the film for me. I'm sure that watching a bunch of cartoon animals jump around isn't your idea of a fun afternoon, but he loved it. And when you took him to Burger King afterward, it was a fabulous surprise for him. He loves triple whoppers with cheese. He came home raving about it. Now you're thinking, oh, that's the least I can do for her. She really is a good friend. You're also a lot more apt to say sure the next time she asks you to baby brother sit. It astounds me how rare this elongated kind of praise is. When criticizing someone, people stretch it out painfully long with all the gory details until it really stings. But when people compliment, they usually spit it out in a sentence or two. This little trick is easy, and the benefits are big. Simply expand your kind words by a few sentences. When they think you're finished, hit them with a few more. The melody and lyrics of your protracted praise make heavenly music for them. Here's a riddle: Why is this technique like foreplay? You probably guessed. The longer it lasts, the better it is. Little trick number forty-four: Stretch your compliments. Hearing praise is, in a sense, making love to someone. Don't make it a quickie. Extend the verbal smooch as long as you can. If you prefer, think of it this way: an actor relishes a round of enthusiastic applause, but it is ecstasy when the audience won't stop clapping. How to enhance your relationship with your partner? The man or woman we have chosen as a life partner is one of. If not the single most important relationships you have in your life, it is also the relationship most often abused. When the romance is new, lovers look into each other's eyes and see ideal reflections of themselves. He sees a strong and capable man who has won his fair lady's heart. 
She gazes into his and sees a beautiful woman inside and out. They feel good about themselves and their partner. They talk lovingly of each other to their parents, to their friends, and to anyone else who will listen. And they constantly praise their new partner. Think about it. If one spoke disparagingly of the other, the obvious question in everyone's mind would be, well, why the heck are you going to marry this person? But often as the years go by, the praise fades and denigration replaces it. How tragic it is that some insecure, insensitive people even complain about their partners to their friends. Don't they realize how it redounds to their own discredit? Between the lines, the listeners hear, I have lousy taste in people. I am cruel, and I am leading a life of quiet desperation living with this dimwit. Shakespeare told us, All the world loves a lover. He forgot to mention, All the world hates a disser. When you express how splendid your partner or spouse is, everyone respects you. In essence, you are saying, I chose the right person for me. I have my life together. I am happy and wise. In my relationship classes, I often ask couples, separately, to write which qualities and accomplishments they are most proud of, and then which ones they admire most in their partner. Afterward, with their permission, the cards are paired up and read to the class. The results astound everyone. Seldom does anyone write that they love their mate for the same characteristics or triumphs that their partner is most proud of. What about you? Is your partner proud of being kind, talented, spiritual, strong, smart, successful, artistic, a wonderful parent? Do you really know? Ladies, suppose you are impressed that your man held down a job while he was in high school. He owned a small business in his senior year, and he was chess champion in his class. Gentlemen, you are thrilled that your lady was the high school homecoming queen, editor of the yearbook, and she started a woman's wrestling team. Years later, at a gathering, the discussion turns to the good old high school days. Ladies, you boast that your husband worked all through high school, i.e., he's hardworking, and even owned his own business, i.e., entrepreneurial. Gentlemen, you burst with pride as you tell the group that your wife was the homecoming queen, i.e. beautiful, and the yearbook editor, i.e. smart. Gentlemen, unbeknownst to your wife, however, you aren't that proud of your early business achievements. You want the group to know that you were the clever chess champion. And ladies, when your husband told the group that you had been the homecoming queen, you secretly thought, and the heck with all that shallow, superficial stuff. You want them to know what an innovative and strong woman you were pioneering a female wrestling team. As the wise philosopher Yogi Berra said, one never know, do one. Listen to your partner carefully when he or she is talking with others. Read between the lines to determine which self-qualities please him or her. Which subjects does she like to talk about? What would he like to show off on his expertise? Those are the ones to broadcast to gain respect and admiration for both of you, not to mention the pride and passion it puts back into your relationship. Little trick number 45. Praise your partner publicly on what he or she is most proud of. Whenever you are talking with others, together or apart, Allude to how exceptional your partner is, even how proud you are of him or her. You especially enhance the relationship if you tout not just the qualities and accomplishments you admire, but those that are the source of his or her self-esteem. How to react when your partner calls you by the wrong name. Has your partner ever called you by somebody else's name? What was your reaction? Shock? Hurt? Anger? Suspicion? Sure, we chuckle when Grandpa gets the kids' names confused. It's a family joke that Aunt Nellie can't keep her nieces and nephews straight. However, if you call your spouse or main squeeze by another person's name, look out. It can raise doubts, start fights, cause weeks of crabbiness, and even plant the seeds of separation. But whoa, stop, let's analyze this. A person's name is no more than an arbitrary jumble of letters that the hospital put on your birth certificate. 
Your high school positioned it under your photo in the yearbook. The government put it on your passport. And someday a stonecutter will carve it into your gravestone. Naturally, friends and lovers remember your name. At normal times, that is. However, given a battle between their memory and strong emotion, the latter is going to win out, especially when it concerns intense feelings like pain, illness, and anger, ditto extreme joy, love, or sexual ecstasy. Let's take sickness as an example. The average man unabashedly reverts to being a little boy when he gets sick. My ex-husband, Barry Farber, was no exception. Now, to my knowledge, there is no medical data supporting the curative effect of chicken soup for the flu, but Barry believed otherwise. At the onset of his symptoms, I was banished to the kitchen to prepare him a pot of it. While I was stirring the noodles on the stove, I heard him call from the bedroom, "Ola, come here!" I was livid because Ola was the name of his first wife, a Swedish nurse. The only reason I didn't throw a fit was because he already felt sufficiently wretched with the flu. I decided to wait until he recovered before making him more miserable. Now, stay tuned for the insight that could help save your relationship. After suffering the Ula abuse, I stormed off to the grocery store. Fortunately, I happened to run into Sidney Gertz, a friend who is a well-respected psychologist. So I laid the entire Ula story on him right there in the canned soup aisle. He let me finish, and then said, "Lil, names are attached to emotions." Barry's first wife was a nurse, right? Well, yes. He continued, in his feverish state, I'm sure he remembered Ula with fondness. She was a professional nurse who gave him excellent care when he was ill. Therefore, it was flattering when he called you by her name. It signifies that he thinks of you as a loving nurse. You've got to be kidding, Sidney. Are you telling me it was a compliment when he called me by her name? He nodded. Hmm. I mumbled. Well, Ula did take good care of him when he was sick. Okay, I told Sidney, but he better not try it when he's better. Wrong again, Lil. He said. It depends completely on what is going on at the moment. Haven't you ever called someone by the wrong name? Well, yes. In what context? He asked. I thought about it and realized Sidney was right. Sometimes Barry and I would argue, and to this day, if someone infuriates me, in a moment of anger, I find myself saying, "Barry, what about you? Does your husband call you by the name of his deceased wife, whom he loved? That is good." Does your wife call you by the name of her ex-husband, whom she hated? That is not. Does your quote faithful partner shout out an unknown name at intimate moments? That is grounds for divorce. Little trick number forty-six: Don't get ticked at the wrong name if it's the right sentiment. Someone calls you by the wrong name. Don't get upset. Get analytical. Consider the context. Ponder your partner's or friend's emotions connected with the name that she called you. So, what should you then do? To enhance your connection with that special someone, tell her you understand why she called you that. Then thank her for the transference of good feelings. Now, here is an important tip for singles, especially if you are a serial dater. Give the person you are currently seeing a nickname:、um, Babe, Honey, Love Bug, Lamb Chop. Then give the same nickname to your next partner, and the next, and the next. That way, you'll never goof up. In conclusion, let's take a final visit to the laboratory. Do you remember the two gentlemen we met in the introduction, the CEO and Joe, the floor cleaner? There was no noticeable difference between them until they said their first words. The CEO recognized Joe's discomfort and then said, "Good job." He also sensed that scientists need to feel their research is significant, and he expressed confidence in the professor's study. He instantly connected with both men and made them feel good about themselves. Based on the small sample of his sensitivity to the floor cleaner and the professor, the CEO probably uses many of the little tricks we've learned. He offers extended praise to his employees when they deserve it. I'm sure he never talks about his wealth around those less fortunate, or uses words too big for his employees. 
Because the CEO wants to provide a good life for his family and employees, as well as himself, he knows how to start good networking conversations, change the subject when necessary, and escape incessant talkers. His email messages connect with recipients. But what about poor Joe? From the small sample of his self-centered comment, "Glad I could help you out," he probably never thinks to make people feel good about themselves or to save them from embarrassment. He has few friends because he never studied strategies to connect with people by starting good conversations or making them feel comfortable while they are chatting. And of course, poor Joe would have progressed further professionally if he hadn't sent self-centered, insecure-sounding emails with thoughtless subject lines. Almost half a century ago, the Beatles wrote, "I get by with a little help from my friends." Well, times have changed, but that reality hasn't. Whatever you want in life, you need friends. Nobody gets to the top alone. So what is the key? It is being able to connect with people by consciously predicting people's emotions and reactions to whatever you say or do, and then acting with sensitivity. These forty-six little tricks are a great start to get you practicing emotional prediction. Some real people you've met in how to instantly connect with anyone. There are a number of people I'd like to thank for demonstrating extraordinary EP and inspiring these forty-six little tricks. With their permission, here are their real names: Arturo Elias, the president of GM Canada from Ontario, for his handshake that makes a powerful connection by touching the shakey's wrist vein. Selena Fisher from San Francisco for sending me a second thank you note saying why her kids love the music box. Tova Svensson, the flight attendant from Örebro, Sweden, for the little trick of complimenting people behind their backs, loud enough for them to overhear. Diana Parks, the speaker from Jackson, Mississippi, for advising me not to use strictly formal grammar when speaking to those with less education. Cheryl Mostrom, the meeting planner from Phoenix, Arizona, for asking me loads of questions about my last few hours. Thus, showing how it creates an instant connection and easy conversation. Jonathan Rom, the horse whisperer from Sullivan County, New York, for the incredible power of watching people's faces when they think no one is looking. John Carlo Parodi, my roommate Sandy's new boyfriend from San Remo, Italy, for speaking exaggeratedly slowly to connect with people who are not as fluent in his language. Camille Mazziotti from Poughkeepsie, New York, for inspiring the shtick name trick by her big smiles when I call her Doctor Camille. Sydney Gertz, the psychotherapist from New York, for convincing me to consider the context when someone calls me by the wrong name. Ivan Batakuda, the architect from the Czech Republic, for teaching me how to demonstrate deference by not turning my cell phone off ahead of time. But doing it audibly at the beginning of conversation, I'd also like to express my gratitude to a few other people who prefer that I just use their first name. Gakuto, the Japanese businessman, for demonstrating respect by holding my business card in both hands. My friends Ebony, Sammy, and Scott for party maneuvers like making an introduction pact with a friend, looking well connected by waving at imaginary friends. Smiling at newcomers in the doorway, escaping incessant talkers, and showing me the advantage of arriving early at a gathering, and my girlfriends Deborah, Vicky, and Patricia, for sending me a happy pub date card on the anniversary of my first book, and thanks to the stranger who inspired the little trick to save people from embarrassment, Robert's mother on the bus, who cleverly covered my gaffe about her child's gender by instantly changing the subject, and of course to the hundreds of males who have proven beyond a reasonable doubt that they do not like sitting with their backs to the door. I'm sure you will succeed in whatever you seek in life. How do I know? Because by listening to this and similar audiobooks, you are investing your time and money. In yourself and your relationships, it is the best investment you can ever make. Please stay in touch. You can write to me through my website, lounge.com. 
L O W N D E S dot com. It may take a little time, but I promise to answer your messages. You can also sign up for my free monthly little trick for big success in relationships. And of course, I'd love to hear the little tricks you have used to win the business, the friendship, and the love that you so richly deserve. Thank you for listening to How to Instantly Connect with Anyone, written and read by Leo Lounds, directed by Elisa Weberman, recorded and engineered by CDM Sound Studios, and produced by Elisa Weberman and Alfred Martino. Production copyright 2009 by Listen and Live Audio Incorporated. All rights reserved. This has been a Listen and Live Audio production. To receive a complete catalog of other fine audiobooks, please call 1-800. 653-9400 or visit our website at www.listenandlive.com If you enjoyed this audiobook be sure to listen to Goodbye to Shy, How to Be a People Magnet How to Capture a First Rate Mate How to Impress Anyone How to Make Anyone Fall in Love with You How to Talk to Anyone and Undercover Sex Signals All by Leo Lounge